Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Roberson, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. I will preside over this public hearing and meeting. I would like to introduce my colleagues on the Safety Board. To my immediate right is Mr. Sean Sullivan. To my immediate left is Mr. Daniel Santos. We three constitute the Board. The Board's Acting General Counsel, Mr. John Batherson, is seated to my far left. The Board's Technical Manager for the Nuclear Materials Processing and Stabilization Group is seated to my far right, Mr. John Pasco. Several members of the Board staff closely involved with oversight of the Department of Energy's Defense Nuclear Facilities at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, are also here seated behind us. Today's hearing and meeting was publicly noticed in the Federal Register on April 2, 2015. This hearing is held open to the public per the provisions of the Government in the Sunshine Act, as well as the Board's regulations implementing the Sunshine Act. In order to provide timely and accurate information concerning the, bud, the Board's public and worker health and safety mission throughout the Department of Energy complex, the Board is recording this proceeding through a verbatim transcript video recording, and live video streaming. The transcript associated documents and public notice will be available for viewing on the Board's public website. In addition, an archived copy of the video recording will be available through our website for at least 60 days. Per the Board's practice and as stated in the Federal Register, we will welcome comments from interested members of the public at the time specified in the published agenda for this proceeding. A list of those speakers who have contacted the board is posted at the entrance to this room. We have generally listed the speakers in the order in which they contacted us, or if possible, when they wish to speak. I will call the speakers in this order and ask that speakers state their name and title at the beginning of their statement. There is also a table at the entrance to this room with a sign-up sheet for members of the public who wish to make a statement but did not have an opportunity to notify us ahead of time. They will follow those who have already registered with us and in the order provided. To give everyone wishing to make a statement an equal opportunity, we ask speakers to be brief and that their comments be relevant to the subject at hand. The chair may interject if speakers exceed five minutes, but will then give consideration for additional time when the agenda prevents. Statements to be limited to comments, technical information, or data concerning the subject of a public meeting and hearing, and the board members may question anyone making a statement to the extent deemed appropriate. The recording of this proceeding will remain open until May 25, 2015. Until this date, members of the public, including those observing today's hearing, live, live via video streaming, may submit a written statement to the board to be included in the record. Contact information for submitting a statement is available on the Board's website. I would like to reiterate that the Board reserves the right to further schedule and regulate the course of this hearing and meeting, to recess, reconvene, postpone, or adjourn this hearing, and to otherwise exercise its authority under the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended. The Board's enabling statute defines the Board's role to advise the Secretary of Energy regarding actions that may be necessary to the protection of public health and safety, including safety of the workers at DOE Defense Nuclear Facilities. The Waste Isolation Pilot Plant is a nuclear waste disposal facility under the control of the Secretary of Energy and falls under the Board's jurisdiction. Therefore, one of the main goals of the Board with this hearing is to inform the public and stakeholders on key actions needed to protect public and worker health and safety as DOE recovers the facility from the two accidents that occurred in February of 2014. WIP's primary mission is to isolate transuranic waste in a deep geologic repository. DOE generated those wastes during decades of defense nuclear activities such as the development, production, and dismantlement of nuclear weapons and the cleanup of contaminated defense nuclear sites. WIP must be operated in accordance with DOE safety requirements and standards, and failure to do so could result in the exposure of the public and workers to hazardous radiological materials. In February 2014, two events, a fire in the underground involving a salt haul truck 
and a separate release of radiological material from transuranic waste drum challenged whether DOE was adequately meeting its safety requirements and standards. The board is providing independent oversight of DOE's response and corrective actions as a result of these events. Today, the board will hold four sessions. The first three sessions will be conducted as a hearing with the board convening three separate panels of witnesses to discuss the safety issues related to these accidents. The fourth session will be conducted as a meeting of the board with input from board staff and the public. The witness during the first three sessions includes senior managers from DOE's Office of Environmental Management, DOE's Carlsbad Field Office, and the WIP contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, LLC. The board will receive testimony regarding actions taken following these two accidents to, to safely recover the WIP underground and implement corrective actions in multiple programs to safely resume and sustain waste operations. The board will then hear testimony from its staff concerning actions taken by the board before and after the two accidents and ongoing board staff oversight activities. After the conclusion of this hearing, the board will convene a meeting of the board itself. In that meeting, the, board deliber the board's deliberation will focus on the board's planned oversight of WIP recovery actions. The public will then be given an opportunity to comment during these deliberations also. This concludes my opening remarks. I will now turn to the other board members for their opening remarks. Mr. Sullivan. I have no remarks at this time. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Santos. Thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Uh, my name is Daniel Santos, and I started with the board back in December of last year. Uh, since then, I have been visiting the various sites across the Department of Energy uh, Defense Nuclear Complex to gain a better understanding of their mission and also the independent oversight role we perform collectively as a defense board. I would like to note that my visit back in March to the waste uh, isolation pilot plant was a priority to me and was also recommended to me by the board staff due to its importance. I have been to the underground, I have met with the workers, and I even also had an opportunity to participate in one of the many frequent town hall meetings on the topic of WIP here in Carlsbad, Carlsbad New Mexico. Uh, throughout my various trips, I have learned to appreciate and understand the role and importance of WIP to the entire um, and overall defense nuclear complex. And I have also witnessed the impact the events of February 2014 have not only on the mission at WIP, but also in, across various other sites. Therefore, I look forward to today's hearing to listen and to learn from the Department of Energy so I can get a better understanding how they're planning to use this opportunity of these events to strengthen, improve, and sustain um, long-term safe operation of the waste isolation pilot plan. Before I conclude my remarks, I would like to first thank the uh, people of Carlsbad, New Mexico, and their officials for hosting us here today. Um, and giving us the opportunity to have this public hearing. I would also like to thank the, uh, the invited panelists and distinguished officials for their willingness to appear, participate, and share information not only with the public, with, but also with the board. Uh, special thanks to the Department of Energy, Carlsbad Field Office and their workers, the Nuclear Waste Partnership, and especially the workers at the, at the facility for giving me what I consider to be a very informative, comprehensive, and most importantly, uh, safe visit ba back in March. And finally, I want to thank the uh, board staff and all the people that provided support both directly and indirectly to making this public hearing. I appreciate and have witnessed the amount of work and attention to detail necessary to put this event together. And I want to thank you. Uh, Madam Vice Chairman, this concludes my opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Santos. At this time, I'd like to begin session one by inviting Mr. Mark Whitney, DOE Acting Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management, to the witness table to provide a statement on behalf of DOE. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Wonderful. 
Uh, I know you have a statement you plan to make. If you uh, would like to submit additional written testimony for the record, please do so at this time. And we're ready to hear your statement. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Roberson uh, and distinguished members, Mr. Santos and Mr. Sullivan of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety uh, Board. I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to share our commitment and vision on the critically important topic of DOE's ongoing waste isolation pilot plant, otherwise known as WIP, of recovery and safety improvement efforts. <clears throat> on behalf of the department, I'm here representing Secretary of Energy Moniz, Deputy Secretary Sherwood Randall, and the Office of Environmental Management. And I have great respect and appreciation for the role of the board uh, in carrying out its important responsibilities. I believe we share a common goal of protecting the workers, the public, and the environment. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the important progress uh, we are currently making in recovering the waste isolation pilot plant. First, let me state that safe performance of our work is, is our overriding priority. It has been my commitment and has, and has also been stated by the Secretary of Energy and it will not be compromised by schedule pressures. This is the clear expectation behind every decision and activity we, we undertake in our WIP recovery efforts. We look forward to continuing to foster a constructive and collaborative relationship between EM and the board uh, and with the goal being of maintaining safe operations at our defense nuclear facilities while meeting our critical cleanup mission. Safety has been a core value and an integral part of EM's vital mission from its inception. Our goal is to continuously improve on the performance and operations in the spirit of integrated safety management. Reflecting on the definition of safety culture, it is an organization's values and behaviors modeled by its leaders and internalized by its members that serve to make the safe performance of work the overriding priority for the workers, public, and the environment. It is imperative to our recovery efforts, and this starts with the behaviors modeled by our managers at headquarters and in the field, both federal and contractor. And I continue to set the expectation for the EM workforce that safety is integral in the accomplishment of our mission. The board will hear more this afternoon and, and early this evening from session two panelists uh, initially this afternoon, Mr. Hutton. Uh, Mr. Franco, Mr. Dunnigan, Mr. McQuinn, and Mr. Blankenhorn, who will present testimony to the specific actions necessary to safely recover uh, the underground. Actions taken and planned to address the key safety elements in WIP recovery, including specific compensatory measures and controls to mitigate risk, fixes to the safety basis and our safety basis strategy, contractor assurance, and the federal strategy to provide adequate oversight. While I will not be participating separately in session three, my expectations will be represented by those members of my senior leadership team who will, who will be providing testimony. I recognize there continues to be a perception among some of the workforce uh, that schedule pressures are taking precedent over safety. I take this concern very seriously and continue to make clear to my management team and our workforce that safety is the overriding priority. We will not let schedule pressures override the safe recovery of WIP and the safety of our workers public and the environment. We've made considerable progress towards safely recovering WIP over the past 13 months. Uh, this includes immediate response to the incidents, evaluation and investigation into these events, defining and implementing re required corrective actions, uh, and that's uh, specific to the first two accident investigation reports and, and of course issuing the high level WIP recovery plan and a detailed baseline uh, September of this past year. The department has a target to resume waste and placement operations in the first quarter of calendar year 2016, but we will only resume operations when it is safe to do so. This means properly establishing the, uh, the safety management programs and upgrading the documented safety analysis to the latest DOE standard, as well as developing a corrective action plan to address the Accident Investigation Board Phase 2 report. Should at any time during the course of developing and implementing these important program improvements, we need to make schedule adjustments, we will do so. Strengthening safety management programs is among the highest priorities within the department and of great importance, of course, to the secretary and to me and that we do what we must to ensure that the events of February 14, uh, 2014 do not happen again. The AIB identified a number of weaknesses in the safety basis uh, and safety management programs at WIP that must be thoroughly addressed. Headquarters, the Carlsbad Field Office, 
and Nuclear Waste Partnership are implementing broad corrective actions to strengthen WIPS nuclear safety, fire protection, emergency management, radiological, and maintenance programs. We are methodically working through reestablishing a bounding safety implement, uh, envelope, rigorously implementing training on new procedures and processes, and responding to all our oversight organization's concerns. And this includes the New Mexico Environment Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, of course, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, and the Office of Enterprise Assessment. We are currently working on corrective action plans in response to the accident investigation phase two report on the radi radiological release. We're in the process of upgrading the WIP documented safety analysis to the DOE standard 3009-2014 that was issued last fall. When these programs, procedures, and safety basis are in place and the workers have been properly trained, we will then conduct a comprehensive review of operational readiness. Uh, this will include a formal operational readiness review uh, at both the contractor <clears throat> and federal levels. And this will ensure that we are prepared to safely restart operations. Underground entries, which were necessary, uh, necessarily so painstaking in the weeks following the radiological event, now are safely performed on a daily basis. And we have been working multi-shift operations in the underground since February. Restoration includes radiological surveys, radiological buffers in non-contaminated areas, ground control stability, uh, roof bolting, and equipment maintenance. To date, over 1,800 bolts have been installed in the underground. Uh, we're finishing the cleaning of electrical equipment uh, from smoke damage, and we're about 75% uh, on that activity. Restoration and maintenance of uh, required equipment is also ongoing. The waste horse, uh, hoist was returned to service in November, allowing more personnel, larger equipment, and materials to be transported into the underground. As an element of the formal accident investigation, we undertook Project REACH to perform a comprehensive video inspection of Panel 7, Room 7. Aerial videos over the waste stacks as well as between the waste stacks were taken and completed in late January. Photographic and uh, video examination found no other breach drums. Successful completion of Project REACH allowed for the issuance of the final AIB report just recently, as well as the technical assessment team report. This was a critical step in continuing our recovery operations. Work is being performed in contaminated areas. The decontamination approach for the walls is to apply a, wa a water mist to create a crust on the salt surfaces, followed by a spray-on fixative for areas of higher activity. We are in the process of preparing floor areas in the underground, leading to panel seven. As you know, adequate ventilation is required for life sustainability, removal of dust during mining, and removing exhaust fumes during diesel engine operations. Increasing ventilation capacity is a principal requirement for safe underground operations. Additional ventilation is necessary because the facility is now, as it has been since the incidents operating in high efficiency particulate air filtration mode at a reduced airflow of, uh, air of approximately 60,000 cubic feet per minute, which of course greatly limits the activities that we can uh, execute underground. Our plan is to increase ventilation in three phases to support increased underground operations, and subsequent testimony later today will provide additional details on those activities. The initial closure of panel six and panel seven, room seven, the underground areas containing the nitrate salt drums is of course a priority for us and then Mexico Environment Department. Uh, and this is needed in order to permanently isolate the suspect waste stream. WIP received an order from the state to perform expedited closure of these areas. Required activities include contaminated bolting, construction of bulkheads, and movement of salt for panel six. The initial closure for the entrance side of panel six was completed on April the 4th. We're working toward completing initial closure of panel six and panel seven, room seven by early summer. To complement the AIB investigation, the department tasked a technical assessment team to determine the mechanisms and chemical reactions that may have resulted in the failure of the waste drum. The technical assessment team was led by the Savannah River National Laboratory and was composed of scientists from Savannah River National Laboratory as well as Lawrence uh, uh, Livermore National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Sandia National Laboratory and Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, it was a truly a multi-laboratory uh, team uh, composed, uh, ma making up the technical assessment team and it included scientific experts in a range of fields, uh, including uh, sampling analysis, forensic science, modeling, and reaction chemistry. This team approach ensured that the appropriate expertise was available 
to assess the event and to support DOE's implementation of WIP recovery. The participation of many scientists enabled the generation and peer review of scientifically based conclusions. The technical assessment team maintained independent authority to direct all activities within its charter. The technical assessment team visited Carlsbad and met with federal and contractor staff at WIP, uh, the mayor's, uh, Carlsbad Mayor's Nuclear Task Force, and attended a special Carlsbad Town Hall meeting to answer questions on their final report that was released on March 26. They were able to make some key determinations, including the contents of the drum involved were chemically incompatible, the drum breached as a result of internal chemical reactions that produce heat and a gas buildup, and drum 68660 was the source of the radiological release in the WIP underground. The results of the technical assessment team provide useful lessons learned and tools as WIP continues to move forward to, toward resuming operations at the facility. These findings, coupled with the results of the recently completed phase two of the accident inve investigation, lend support to the need and appropriateness of moving forward with panel closure, and that is the approach that we are taking. The accident investigation board's three reports evaluated in detail both the salt, truck fire, and radiological events. The AIB identified the weaknesses with the site office and headquarters in conducting effective line management oversight and holding personnel accountable for correcting repeated issues. The AIB also identified weaknesses in the execution of the Nuclear Waste Partnership Contractor Assurance System, which did not identify precursors to these events. On April 16th, the AIB Phase II report was released with 40 judgments of need. The AIB completed an exhaustive investigation at WIP, as well as at Los Alamos National Laboratory to examine the cause of radiological release at WIP and identified judgments of need regarding managerial controls and safety measures necessary to prevent or minimize the pro probability or severity of a recurrence of this type of accident. Based on post-event chemical, radiological, and fire forensic analyses, the AIB concluded that the release was caused by an exothermic reaction involving the mixture of organic materials and nitrate salts in one drum that was pro processed at Los Alamos National Laboratory in December of 2013. The board also concluded that an underground salt hall fire uh, that occurred, a salt truck fire that occurred at WIP on February 5th, 2014, did not cause or contribute to the radiological release event. The IB's findings identify shortcomings within both contractor and federal processes at LANL, WIP, Environmental Management, and the National Nuclear Security Administration. I understand that Mr. Ted Weika, the AIB chair, briefed you recently uh, on the results of the accident investigation and will further be discussing uh, individual aspects of these investigations in more detail during session three today. I said previously that our goal is to continuously improve our safety performance and operations in the spirit of integrated safety management. The integrated safety management system is the department's enduring framework for the approach to the safe performance of work. The integrated safety management's guide attachment 10, safety focus areas, and associated attributes outline our vision for what a positive safety culture and a safety conscious work environment looks like and feels like, providing specific attributes of leadership, employee engagement, and organizational learning. These are not just words, they are values and expectations that the Secretary and I expect to be demonstrated on a daily basis. In summary, WIP is an important national resource that will recover from this unfortunate incident. We'll, we'll resume disposal operations when it is safe to do so. The safety of our employees, the public, and the environment is first and foremost. We have kept the community and a wide range of stakeholders informed along the way of WIP recovery and will continue to do so. We will continue working with our regulators and stakeholders around the country as we move toward resumption of the safe operations at WIP. As always, I invite you to contact me directly if you ever have any concerns about our activities involving WIP recovery or other, other, other facilities. I thank you again for the opportunity to discuss the department's efforts. I'll now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Whitney. Why don't we uh, take a minute here, and we, we do have questions for you, and sure. let's make sure a court reporter is situated. Thank sure. you. Is that better? Like Testing, is that better? Yes, sir. And once again, thank you, Mr. Whitney, for your uh, statement.
Actually, I'm going to start out with the first question, and, and then we'll let the other board members chime in. The, the Accident Investigation Board boards multiple, I guess it was the course, same core set of people, but uh, added and expanded for expertise. Uh, the boards for the Salt Hall truck fire and the radiological release events identified a number of deficiencies with the safety basis and safety management programs relied on, relied upon at WIP to protect the workers and members of the public from radiological hazards. And you talked a bit about this in your statement. They also identified concerns with the contractor and federal organizations managing, executing, and overseeing the safety of nuclear operations. During today's hearing, we're going to explore with your staff and with your contractor uh, actions taken and plan to correct the, you know, the number of deficiencies identified. But what specifically, I mean, you're in charge of this enterprise, not just WIP, but the entire complex that is now also unable to benefit from the operation at WIP. What specific lessons learned are you taking away from this event? And in particular, how are you incorporating them into your expectations for managing and overseeing the safety of operations at WIP? Thank you, uh, Ms. Roberson. You hit on it, oversight um, and ineffective oversight um, is a uh, recurring theme throughout the, the AIB reports. Um, and it was uh, highlighted um, uh, extensively in phase two report that was just released. Um, and so we have uh, uh, set out on a course to uh, strengthen our oversight through, through many different mechanisms. Uh, and, and you also, I think, correctly alluded to the fact, getting a little bit of feedback here, um, alluded to the fact that this is not just a WIP issue. This is something that we do need to apply across the complex. Um, and, but let me start by uh, talking about Carlsbad first okay. uh, and what we've, what we've done there. Of course, we um, have developed corrective action plans for the first two AIB uh, reports uh, and are in the process of developing a corrective action plan uh, for the third and final report. Um, and those are very detailed. Um, and the, the reports, I think, uh, the team did an excellent job identifying the deficiencies and weaknesses where, where they are, uh, as well as the judgments of need and, and giving us a, a path forward to, um, to resolving those. So with Carlsbad, uh, the, the oversight, uh, we approach it kind of in a multi-prong uh, uh, way. One, resources was uh, uh, an issue. Um, they did not have the resources that they need, quite frankly to do an effective uh, oversight job. Um, so we, uh, shortly after the event, shortly after I came on um, uh, last uh, summer, we uh, authorized an additional 22 uh, uh, folks to work at CBFO, an additional 22 FTEs, many of those in safety oversight functions, um, uh, we, including very senior folks in the organization, also including facility representatives, folks, uh, nuclear safety uh, individuals, uh, Carlsbad also looked at their uh, organization uh, and, and realized and found that not only was it structured in a way that uh, did not clearly delineate the roles and responsibilities of the program and the oversight, um, but also there were individuals within the organization that were doing both roles. So it wasn't just an organization that was, you know, with one uh, office doing this, but we had folks responsible for both uh, aspects. So they, they uh, reorganized, uh, developed uh, a, uh, a plan for reorganization and uh, created two uh, divisions, one an operations oversight division and one a production division. So trying to get the production and the oversight separated so we can have some independence on the oversight part. They hired, uh, created a new assistant manager position uh, for that uh, oversight uh, role uh, who reports directly to the CBFO manager. I think those were very initial and very important uh, first steps uh, for the organization. Um, they are also uh, n revising basic implementing procedures for how they do things uh, in the organization, uh, specifically with those things in mind. Uh, they have revised uh, training and qualification program, and they're currently uh, working on that now for the individuals who have these uh, areas uh, under their responsibility. Um, they're doing things like revising position descriptions um, that make it clear if you have oversight responsibilities, you will be held accountable, and that's how your, your performance will be, uh, will be judged. Um, at EM headquarters, trying to get to more, maybe more broadly, how we're applying this across the complex, um, we've also uh, provided additional resources to EM for, fifth, uh, 
EM50, EM40. Uh, EM50 would not help us in this <laughs> area probably, but EM40, which is our uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Safety, Security, and Quality Programs. Uh, we've uh, just recently provided them some additional FTEs, um, many of them in the safety oversight area, uh, with an agreement to reevaluate if, if those are sufficient in the near future. And so we'll keep, uh, keep on that uh, to, to make sure that they're adequately staffed. As um, the head of that office, the Deputy Assistant Secretary Jim Hutton, has told me, and he'll probably talk a little bit about this today, is we need to make sure that our oversight blanket spreads across the complex. Um, and, uh, and something else he'll probably talk about is a specific program that he is uh, developing to, to, uh, uh, with that in mind. So, so, can, so can I ask you, so I think the, the providing the resource was absolutely was critical. Do, do you think the expectations for oversight emanating from headquarters out into the field were clear as well? I, I think that uh, the expectations um, when they were developed, the requirements are clear. We need to do a better job of reinforcing those, never being complacent. Uh, that, I think that's one thing that we've learned is complacency is, uh, is, is not an option in, in what we do. Uh, and so we need to, to make sure that we're, we're on that. And um, another thing that uh, Jim Hutton likes to say is anxiety is a good thing in this area. And anytime we feel confident that we have things figured out, that's probably you know, a problem. Okay. Um, and so we need to continue to work okay. on this. Well, I don't want to hog all the time, so I'm, I'm actually going to let Mr. Sullivan, uh, I think he ha he's got a question or two for you as well. Right. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Whitney. Um, the, uh, the incidents in, uh, back in February of last year, uh, over a year later, as best as we can tell, these were really two completely separate accidents. Uh, other than the coincidence of time, uh, there really was no relationship between them. Is that, is that correct? Yes, the, the AIB uh, report did find uh, that the, uh, the fire event uh, did not impact or uh, result in the February 14th radiological release incident. Okay, so my question to you is, um, I'm wondering if we'd only had one would we be where we are today? Uh, the fire accident, for example, um, showed that there were many issues here, including cultural issues, raised the question of whether uh, the workforce uh, and the oversight was treating the, this as, as a mine and not a nuclear facility. Um, at, <clears throat> And so that, that had several significant issues. Uh, from a nuclear perspective, uh, well, let me go back to the fire. I mean, from a, if, you're, if I'm a worker, I, I look at these two issues, and I'm, that's probably the scarier one, right? I mean, it, the workers, their lives were directly threatened by the smoke that they were uh, trying to avoid that day, right? <clears throat> Less scary for them would be the radiation release event, but probably has greater wide-ranging implications for the department. Uh, so there's, there's a different set of things there. And it's even more different because when you go and find the real problem that instigated that release, it wasn't here. That problem was elsewhere mm -hmm. um, and, and not here with, with anybody who was doing any work uh, at, here at the site. So again, I'm back to my question. It's a long lead into my question. Yep. What if we only had one? What if we'd only had the fire? Would we today be looking at the safety basis and other issues that the RAD release has, has brought up? What if we'd only had the RAD release? Would we be looking at the cultural type issues? You know, because the RAD release didn't originate here, would we have been looking at the cultural type issues? Can you, can you address um, whether or not this coincidence in time uh, has uh, somehow multiplied the effect of one accident uh, mm -hmm. greater so that we're, we're greater than the sum of the two. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And I cannot sit here and say that we would be in the same place today with respect to um, our uh, you know, actions moving forward uh, in the area of um, you know, safety management program, safety basis, what we're doing with respect to oversight. Um, because the AIB reports, um, they did have uh, 
some different, uh, are, are not identical findings, some different judgments of need. And uh, so without the two events, we wouldn't have had the compilation of, of conclusions and, and judgments of need. So I, I'm not going to say that we would be in the exact same place because that's clearly not the case. I do uh, agree with you that the February 5th incident was a, a very significant uh, uh, event, very unfortunate event, and, and, and probably the greater of the two with respect to risk to the worker. Uh, and so I, I do feel uh, that uh, that event alone would have necessitated the AIB that we had, the findings that we had, which, on the other hand, even though they weren't the exact same findings, there are some findings, many findings actually, that are very similar with respect to safety management. Um, and so I think uh, in many respects, and oversight, and in many respects we would be on, on some of these broader issues that I think are um, applicable to the entire complex, we would be in the same uh, in the same position. But I can't say that we would be in the exact same position that, you know, the uh, the confluence, the, the uh, coincidence of the timing of the two events uh, has led us to the point we are today with three different reports, uh, very detailed reports that I think have uh, allowed us to outline a path forward, not just to whip recovery, uh, but to improving the way we do things across the complex. Okay, so, um, it, you know, I, I think that the coincidence of time uh, simply points up that the workforce here, um, and by extension the public, they, they really deal with two different dangers, and, and they're both dangerous, <laughs> as dangers tend to be. Uh, they deal, they're, first, they're in a mine, they're underground, they're confined, they have to rely on uh, elevators and other systems to get them to the surface if anything goes wrong. And secondly, they're dealing with dangerous uh, nuclear materials. Um, so the only way that uh, this can be handled safely, and it can be handled safely, as, a, as a, we've demonstrated in the past and I'm sure we'll demonstrate again in the future, is with a good, strong culture. Now, you talked about trying to affect that uh, through how you were reorganizing the oversight. So can you tell us a little bit more about what, what is being done here uh, with respect to the oversight provided by the Department of Energy uh, so that we can understand better where you're trying to go uh, in establishing the right culture here? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, and, and the safety culture, of course, um, efforts that we're undertaking uh, there are the broader efforts that have been ongoing, and then there are specific efforts uh, related to WIP, um, the Carlsbad Field Office, the Nuclear Waste Partnership as well. So let me start with, with that and, and, and some of the things that, uh, that are ongoing here at the site. Uh, one thing that has recently occurred, um, and I, I think you're right, safety culture. Um, let me step back one, one minute because you hit something that I think is, is very important. You know, this mine has, uh, and it goes back to complacency and where we are. I, I think uh, part of it, our success, uh, you know, led to some complacency. We have not had these issues at WIP. It's been such a stellar operating uh, organization without incident, a significant incident for, for many, many years. And I want to just, the workers and the workforce, they work hard, they do their job, and they're proud of what they do. Um, and so I in no way want to uh, attribute any blame to the workforce. You're right, it, the culture issues are things that we have to, to address. It's something we obviously have not uh, you know, fixed that we need to continue to fix, um, continue to work on. Um, we've, uh, at the previous hearing, we talked more broadly about some of our efforts uh, in that regard. Here, uh, just recently in December, uh, the Nuclear Waste Partnership requested an assist visit from the uh, from industry, uh, from experts uh, in the industry, folks from uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, NASA, um, and uh, Department of Energy. Others uh, made up uh, an info assist visit. Uh, they came through um, and uh, did a fairly in-depth review of the safety culture here. Um, and I think uh, now NWP and the site here are moving forward with looking at those findings and recommendations and, and ensuring that those are captured appropriately and, and, and acted upon. Um, we are, of course, continuing and, and reemphasizing here at WIP the efforts that we have been undertaking with respect to safety conscious work environment um, and ensuring that training is provided to all the workforce. Um, just uh, uh, within the last few months, we uh, trained an additional 44 folks here 
uh, on site and safety conscious work environment. And safety culture sustainment planning is ongoing, uh, leading to a point where we will uh, have developed a, a, a complex wide safety culture sustainment program. Uh, we have uh, received uh, building off of the, some of the self assessments that were completed and some of the independent reviews that were completed at our sites. Um, the, all of our sites developed uh, safety culture sustainment plans, issued those to, to us at headquarters. We've done a thorough review of those. Uh, we've been uh, always coordinating and communicating with the sites as we review to understand what's going on. Uh, and we will uh, very uh, soon uh, be issuing, I'll be issuing a, uh, an approval of their plans or approval with conditions uh, depending on the site. Um, so that's another effort. Um, but to me, it, it, it does go back to complacency. I don't want to sound like we have it all figured out uh, and that we are in the exact right place we need to be with uh, respect to safety culture. I can assure you uh, that uh, we are treating it very seriously and, and safety is our priority in all that we do. And you'll hear a lot about that today on, on, on how we're moving forward here at the site um, with respect to the safety basis and, and safety management programs as well. Okay, and specifically uh, separating uh, within the, the field office, separating programmatic uh, responsibilities from oversight responsibilities. Do you think that will uh, successfully contribute to improvement here within the, the culture? I think uh, within oversight, certainly, and I think that will, con and that itself will help with the, the safety culture. But as you know, it'll take a, uh, a, a variety of different things that we need to do, not just here, but across the complex uh, to continue to improve the safety culture. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to follow up on, on that line of question before I turn it over to Mr. Santos. So, so the investigation board identified concerns with C, CBFO, that CBFO had allowed the safety culture at RIP to deteriorate as evidenced by worker feedback and workers did not feel comfortable identifying less issues that might as adversely impact management direction, delay the mission, or otherwise affect cost and schedule. So I, I kind of say, okay, that's CBFO, but I would say EM also has to look in the mirror at itself as well. So what is EM headquarters doing to ensure a better safety culture at WIP so that you, you don't find yourself. So mm -hmm. we're talking about recovery now. Other sites in your complex have waste building up. Um, I think EM headquarters has a tremendous role to play here. And I guess I just, I understand you say you've increased your staffing in your safety over, oversight organization, but are there other principles? Are there expectations uh, that would improve the oversight from headquarters as well? To ensure that there's a good safety culture uh, surrounding this site. Yes, uh, thank you. And and I because it's related to this, I will I will add that um, in addition to the uh, new hiring authorities, uh, we have uh, Jim Hutton's office, and not just from headquarters, but from across the complex, uh, we've had folks uh, on the ground here in Carlsbad uh, supporting Joe Franco and his team. Um, uh, since very early on, for over a year now. Many folks, nuclear uh, safety experts, folks that are recognized in the field with, with decades of experience in, in working in nuclear facilities. Um, and that is, of course, another uh, effort that we're trying to do from headquarters to, to, to uh, affect that, uh, the positive change uh, with respect to oversight. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, what additional things that we're doing uh, at WIP. Uh, we, I personally um, uh, uh, was uh, participated, I guess is the right way to say it, in the, uh, the MPO assist visit. Um, I was uh, uh, interviewed by the, the folks and, and provided comments and, um, and then also under, you know, had an opportunity to uh, read their findings and their recommendations. And um, you're right, you know, my observation is uh, part of it is that uh, the, there is a perception uh, within the workforce that we have prioritized uh, production over safety, um, uh, quite frankly, um, and uh, specifically as it relates to whip recovery. So um, that is a uh, unintended consequence of uh, trying to uh, uh, resume operations. Um, but I think a point that we've missed and haven't been as clear on as we should have been, because it is 
uh, it is our strategy and our focus is resuming operations at WIP first and foremost uh, involve uh, establishing the safety envelope to resume operations. That's our first priority. And so when we talk about resuming WIP operations and recovering operations, uh, we should be explicit that that's what we're talking about. Everything else will follow. Um, and so we need to do a better job on that. Mr. Santos. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chairman. And good afternoon, Mr. Whitney. On. Yeah, sorry. Um, prior to the February 2014 events, and even after those events, uh, there continues to be evidence with some challenges and deficiencies identified by multiple teams associated with um, work planning and control, execution of procedures, the use of expert judgment, and all of that. Uh, is, is this unique to this facility? Do you also see this across the complex? And what are some of the actions uh, you may be taking uh, headquarters-wide? Yeah, I, I don't think it's unique to WIP. Un unfortunately, it's a, it's a constant uh, battle. I mean, these are, uh, as you know, uh, very complex facilities and comp complex operations in many cases with uh, operations procedures and processes that if you put them all together, you know, could probably fill this entire uh, auditorium. So it is, it is a constant uh, struggle and a constant challenge to stay on top of that to make sure, because things change. Our work changes. We develop new work packages to advance to the next stage of whatever cleanup we're doing uh, at sites. And so um, I would like to say that it, maybe it's unique, but it's not unique. And it will be something that we will continue to have to stay on top of uh, and continue to work. And, you know, it is a, uh, from my time at Oak Ridge, I know it is something that we spend uh, uh, a lot of time on uh, working with the contractor on these specific issues, work, work plan and control, work packages, um, because that's where you, that's where you get in trouble. Um, and uh, so, so you're right, uh, it, but it is, it's not only uh, at WIP. Okay. My, my next qu question goes back to oversight. Um, how would you go about leveraging uh, the methodologies, the composition, or the unique aspect of this accident investigation board so you can leverage across your oversight initiatives so, such that I don't need an accident and the composition of a accident investigation board to come up with some of the conclusions that may not even have to do with an accident uh, like, mm -hmm. like they reported, and we can strengthen the, uh, the oversight. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. Thanks, Mr. Santos. Yes, um, and, and that is precisely, you, you know, it would be uh, easy to want to focus on WIP and focus on recovery, focus on all the, um, and, and, and Los Alamos, on all the uh, uh, findings uh, in the AIB reports, but we have to apply those, uh, those findings across uh, the complex. And they're not, even the things that are directly related to true waste operations, uh, packaging, processing, um, a lot of those things are directly applicable to other areas uh, within the cleanup program. And so what we've, what we've done is, um, for the first two reports, of, of course, we, um, we issued those to the field, uh, to the field managers. Uh, we've had in-depth conversations with the field managers uh, about those uh, seeking uh, uh, from them opportunities to uh, lessons learned that they may uh, take away from those and um, we have uh, continuously coming in as we you know uh, have uh, additional uh, findings um, things coming in from the sites that we're, we have uh, a site manager who has detailed exactly what they've done with respect to WIP they, they don't have a repository but they have a EM program and they've taken lessons learned now many of them have the uh, benefit uh, of having folks that served here at WIP after the incidents to help with recovery, to help with the AIB uh, investigations uh, and so forth. Um, and so we have specific examples of that. It's something that we continue to emphasize. And then with this last AIB report, I uh, recently issued guidance to uh, all the uh, senior leadership team, uh, including of course all, the, all, all our site managers on what our path forward is with respect to this. And so uh, uh, one, the expectation is that they not only read uh, and review the report, uh, but they uh, they talk about it with their contractors. They talk about it with their uh, with their employees, um, and then we are going to meet. and And Ted Weika will be uh, briefing each site individually on the findings uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, and then in early June, we are going to reconvene 
um, uh, the senior leader, EM senior leadership team specifically to look at this and specifically to consider what lessons we may learn. And here, you know, from some of the sites, what they're already looking at and applying. <clears throat> Oak Ridge, for example, uh, within the last few weeks, I received an email from, from their site which outlined in great detail what they did um, to look at the previous two uh, reports um, and lessons learned they took from those and how they're moving forward and, and developing their own corrective action plan uh, to ensure that they don't have issues that result from some of the deficiencies that were found in the report. Um, so we, we do want to move forward aggressively on that. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's my expectation that we will. And I have one last follow-up question. And you touched briefly on operating experience and how you plan to share complex-wide. Uh, any plans to uh, share and evaluate lessons learned and leverage from international experience of similar type uh, facilities or repositories? You know, I think we do, we do that. Um, uh, I, and to be quite honest with you, I haven't thought of it in terms of the, the IAB reports, but just what we can learn from, from other uh, facilities. Actually, um, the, uh, one of our senior leadership team in the front office just recently returned from UK, okay. um, and uh, where she visited the facilities, and uh, she said she has a lot of lessons to bring back that mm -hmm. we can apply to, to some of our facilities, and uh, so I look forward to that. So I think that's something that we do. We don't, we don't do it a lot. We tend, you know, we have... We have challenges at home that we're always trying to trying to deal with, but it's important. You're right because there are a lot of approaches that that we may not have considered, um, and uh, and I uh, appreciate the value of that. I, um, I used to work in, uh, in on international programs, including for EM uh, and in, and for NSA, and so I understand the value that that could bring to a, to a program. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. That concludes my question, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitney, I want to ask you specifically about uh, emergency response. Uh, so while, let's talk about the RAD release event in particular, while the workforce here didn't cause the event, uh, as the Accident Investigation Board Phase 1 for that event report indicates there were uh, plenty of deficiencies in response. The biggest one, uh, in my view, being uh, timely notifications weren't made back to folks in Washington, D.C., such as your predecessor, to respond. Uh, yeah, I found out about that event on Saturday, and again, coincidence, we had a staff member here who was observing the entry into the mine post-fire, and he, on Saturday morning, he, that staff member came to the site, was given access to the site, um, and, you know, because he was just coming back for that day's events. Um, and then, then several, so about nine, I think, in the morning. So this is now 10 hours after the first indication of a problem. Uh, then they were told to shelter in place. And so I found out about it because I had a staff member here who then made phone calls back to our agency to say that something was up. So I think there were many breakdowns in letting the folks uh, know back in Washington, D.C. So my question is, what, what's been done to fix that problem? Whether there was an issue here mm -hmm. or somewhere else uh, within the complex in the future, I'm sure you want to know about it so you can get the facts and begin to bring the expertise that you have available to you uh, to help affect the problem. W what are you doing to make sure that you're getting proper notification? Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, the, uh, as you noted, the uh, first AIB report was uh, you know, had a very large part uh, to do with the response uh, to the fire and um, as well as the second report had a response to the release. Uh, neither of those were adequate for sure. Uh, the uh, NWP uh, and our offices here have revamped the environmental uh, or emergency response uh, programs, processes, systems. Uh, that, doesn't, uh, that includes not only equipment and systems, um, but also uh, the way they do that, including a notification. Um, and that is uh, something that we'll continue to uh, work on moving forward. And I know that folks that will participate in the uh, later sessions will have more uh, in-depth detail uh, on, on what has been done. Okay. Um, I have a, another question, which I think will be quick, uh, but I'm shifting topics now. So the office, uh, DOE's Office of uh, Enterprise Assessments, uh, office run by Mr. Panonsky, yes. uh, 
back in Washington. Uh, they came out and did a post-incident review of the maintenance program, and they issued a report in December. Uh, the executive summary for the report says they're going to do more such reviews, and I'll just quote from it quickly. It says, as the recovery and transition to operational activities uh, progress, the EA's oversight will also include a comprehensive review of WIPS operations as requested by the Acting Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management, which is, which is you. So I guess my question to you is, uh, what, what are you planning to request to have them do? Uh, well, one thing that we would like for them to do is, is take another view. I, I think it's, it's uh, always good, and I, I respect the work of, of Glenn Podonsky's office. I think they do a very thorough job, and they can generally find things that we may not have found before. And so just general operational, uh, what happened with the events uh, and, and, and why they happened, um, they may have a different angle, a different uh, outlook that could provide us um, some, you know, some uh, uh, additional ways of moving forward. And so that's, that's what I would like. And uh, I think it's a, although sometimes I know that uh, Joe and his uh, team here probably feel like they're getting a lot of reviews <laughs> and, and a lot of uh, operational burden, I think they also recognize the importance and the value of that moving forward. Uh, when we do resume operations, we need to be sure that we're ready uh, to, to do so safely. Um, the uh, I will just touch on because I didn't have since you mentioned the maintenance in the first uh, review that uh, uh, enterprise assessments did um, you know, we have uh, uh, we did reach out to all of our sites um, again as an uh, uh, attempt to take some of the lessons learned from WIP uh, particularly the fire event uh, and apply that uh, across the complex uh, to uh, uh, direct the sites to provide a report on deferred maintenance uh, particularly focused on uh, safety related systems um, what we found from that from the input that we received from the sites was that uh, uh, generally across the board uh, safety significant systems were well accounted for well tracked and well followed through upon uh, any any type of work that needed to be done uh, safety related uh, systems um, th not so evenly applied across the complex and so that's something that we're taking a very close look at right now in the area of deferred maintenance uh, to one uh, ensure that we're all accounting for it the same way with the same rigor uh, and two making sure that we uh, fund those activities um, the safety significant uh, systems uh, are funded within within the operational funds that uh, sites receive they don't need to request additional funds they know that that is something the expectation and responsibility is for them to fund those systems and the, the maintenance on those systems um, but we the safety uh, related systems um, and I think we learned a, a very good lesson um, unfortunately from the fire event uh, on, on why that's so important um, but that's something we're going to be focusing on moving forward okay uh, just back quickly on the um, the enterprise assessments potential for future reviews is there anything scheduled yet uh, I believe that they are uh, conducting a review right now. Um, is that correct? Okay. So okay. yeah. So the uh, the board staff has the has the schedule on that. But uh, my understanding is right now or imminently they are conducting a review. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I guess just one more question because we're running out of time, and and maybe this is is partly commentary, partly not. I, I guess the two things that struck me from all the investigations, and I, I just kind of like your straightforward reaction, whether it's here or for the record. Uh, you know, one was changes over time deteriorated really the understanding of the status of your safety basis for the facility. And the other was, I mean, this is, this is a premier safety operation. It had a tremendous safety record. It was recognized not just nationally, internationally for safety performance. And, and then we have a, a thing go wrong and we find those foundational things underneath don't really support the conclusion. I, I think one of the terms that I hear from leaders in the department these days is the perception of what existed wasn't the reality. And so when I look at EM headquarters, I mean, the, the investigation revealed a whole host of things and we're going to talk about a lot of those through, uh, through the rest of the day <clears throat> but I, I just wanted to get to what's the key takeaway for EM headquarters that will have an effect on its oversight of WIP going forward 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Roberson. You're exactly right on um, the, the first point, the changes uh, over time really uh, deteriorated our understanding of, of where we were with respect to safety basis. And so that, that in itself is a very key finding for us and, and allows us to move forward. And so as we're developing the, the revision to the safety basis uh, now, uh, we are, one, using the most recent standard, as I mentioned, the 3009-2014, uh, the DOE safety basis standard, uh, which was revised just uh, late last year. Um, and that has to be the priority for us before we resume operations at WIP is, is reestablishing the safety envelope and doing it correctly. Um, and then to your, your point about the you know, stellar record and, um, and we thought we had it right before and the event happens and, and you know, what's to prevent maybe that from happening again. Um, you know, we clearly did not have it right. Um, and, uh, and it gets back to, I think, my point earlier that complacency because of, precisely because of the stellar safety record, um, you know, kind of was our, our worst enemy. And um, we can't get complacent. Uh, we have to continue to focus, continue to maintain that anxiety um, that my colleague talks about and, uh, and move forward and focus on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for entertaining our questions. Uh, and you are free to uh, leave. Thank at you, Mr. Roberts. And we're going to take a two minute break so you don't ruffle things as you leave and we can prepare for the next session. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's get back on this, uh, get the show back on the road. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, uh, while, uh, while we're preparing to start session two, I want to acknowledge the presence of Mayor Janway, who is circling the aisle. Thank you, Mayor, for coming. We look forward to any contribution you have to make today. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to begin session two of the hearing, which will focus on DOE's actions necessary to safely recover the whip underground prior to resuming waste handling operations. During this session, the board will explore actions planned and taken by DOE to address the key safety elements in the WIP recovery plan and how compensatory controls co implemented under temporary safety basis documents and safety management programs will protect the workers and the public during recovery activities. The board will also address DOE's strategy for providing adequate federal oversight during the recovery phase. I'd like to start this session by introducing Mr. Carter Shuffler, who is the technical staff lead uh, for overseeing the safety of recovery activities at RIP, RIP for the board and a member of the board's nuclear materials processing and stabilization team. Mr. Shuffler will provide testimony from the board staff. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chairman and members of the board. For the record, my name is Carter Shuffler. I am a member of the board's technical staff responsible for overseeing the safety of nuclear operations at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or the WIP site. In this statement, I'll provide a brief overview of the board's oversight activities at WIP before and immediately after the Salt Hall truck fire and radiological release event in February 2014. I'll discuss the findings of DOE's Accident Investigation Board related to these events and the corrective actions proposed by DOE and its contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, or NWP, to address these findings. I will then discuss DOE's recovery plan for resuming waste operations at the site. And finally, I will discuss the staff's recent oversight activities at WIP and highlight lessons learned from the February 2014 events that the staff is factoring into its future oversight at WIP and other DOE defense nuclear facilities. WIP is a deep geologic repository for permanent disposal of transuranic or true waste generated as a byproduct of defense nuclear activities across the nuclear weapons complex. Deliberate safe disposal of these wastes, which contain long-lived radioactive isotopes, is crucial to ensure the safety of the public, facility workers, and environment surrounding the WIP site. 
Permanent disposal of true waste also improves the safety posture at generator sites such as the Idaho, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and the Hanford and Savannah River sites. NWP manages and operates the WIP site under contract to the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy representatives, including personnel located at the Carlsbad Field Office, have the responsibility for WIP contract oversight and regulation. The board and their staff conduct oversight of defense nuclear facilities across the Department of Energy complex, including operations at the WIP site. The board's oversight consisted mostly of monitoring and reporting on operations at WIP through 2009. The following year, after an on-site review identified safety issues with work planning and control, the board began a more aggressive oversight approach that resulted in a series of communications to DOE. In an October 2010 letter to DOE, the board identified weaknesses in the implementation of integrated safety management at WIP during activity level work planning and control. These weaknesses resulted in procedures that did not contain necessary controls and cannot be performed as written. In June 2011, after reviewing the WIP fire protection program, the board identified deficiencies with the WIP fire hazard analysis, highlighting its failure to adequately address all fire hazards in the underground. Finally, in a June 2012 letter to DOE, the board identified weaknesses in the WIP maintenance program, including poor quality procedures that rendered many work control documents unable to be performed as written or inaccurate. Many of the safety issues identified in these letters are similar to the recent findings of DOE's Accident Investigation Board that I will discuss later in this testimony. In February 2014, two significant events occurred at the WIP site. On February the 5th, a fire associated with a salt haul truck occurred in the underground requiring an evacuation. 86 workers in the underground were evacuated during this event. Six workers were subsequently treated for smoke inhalation at Carlsbad Medical Center, and seven workers were treated on site. DOE initiated an accident investigation board and began deploying team members to the WIP site within a few days after the fire event. On February the 14th, a radiological material release event initiated from one or more true waste containers located in panel 7 in the WIP underground. A continuous air monitor detected the release and provided an interlock signal to switch from normal, unfiltered ventilation flow to filtered ventilation flow, which directs air from the underground through high efficiency filters. The event started at approximately 11.15 p.m. at night and no workers were in the underground. The high efficiency filters significantly reduced the release of radioactive material, but did not fully mitigate the event, in part due to leakage through two bypass dampers. 21 individuals subsequently tested positive for low levels of internal contamination and small quantities of plutonium and americium were identified off-site. On the day after the fire event, February the 6th, 2014, the board deployed a senior staff member stationed at the Los Alamos National Laboratory to the WIP site. The board subsequently deployed a senior fire protection engineer from our Washington, D.C. office. These individuals were initially focused on oversight and observation of the fire response, investigation, and recovery activities, including walkdowns of the fire scene and the WIP underground, along with members from DOE's Accident Investigation Board. The board's representatives reported to the WIP site on the morning of February the 15th, 2014, along with members from DOE's Accident Investigation Board and other DOE and WIP employees unaware of the radiological release. As information was revealed concerning the radioactive material release event, the board's representatives maintained an oversight role and commuted, communicated with senior DOE and NWP officials. The board's field representatives provided the latest real-time information to the board and their staff interfaced with senior WIP DOE and contractor personnel on safety issues, observed response and recovery actions, and conducted field walkdowns of facility conditions. The board staff in Washington, D.C. organized a support team consisting of staff safety experts in safety, emergency management, fire protection, ventilation, radiological controls, and other areas. This team provided real-time support to the field representatives to ensure the best knowledge was being applied and communicated during and following the events. Based on feedback from this team, the board communicated with the Secretary of Energy on March 12, 2014, on the important role the filtered ventilation system was providing at WIP to confine radioactive material within the mine. The board advised that DOE thoroughly evaluate the safety controls and contingency plans necessary to maintain confinement to ensure adequate protection of the workers and the public. The board's field representatives and staff closely followed subsequent actions taken by DOE and NWP to ensure the filtered ventilation system is maintained as a highly reliable system. 
Following the events in February, the board deployed additional field representatives and subject matter experts to WIP as warranted based on DOE and NWP response and recovery activities. This included a safety basis expert and health physicist. The board maintained full-time oversight coverage at the WIP site from February to early May 2014. After that, the board staff participated in daily calls with WIP personnel to continue following investigation and recovery activities. The Accident Investigation Board completed its reviews of the Salt Hall truck fire and the radiological release event phase one in March and April of 2014. The investigation revealed deficiencies in both the documented safety analysis and safety management programs relied upon at WIP to protect the public and facility workers from potential exposure to radiological materials. The Investigation Board further identified weaknesses in the contractor and federal organizations managing, executing, and overseeing the safety of WIP operations. I'll address each of these briefly, starting with the documented safety analysis. DOE Standard 3009 provides guidance and requirements for preparing a documented safety analysis to meet federal nuclear safety requirements. The Accident Investigation Board identified several instances in which the WIP documented safety analysis was inconsistent with the DOE standard, lacked conservatism, or contained errors and omissions suggesting a lack of rigorous contractor and federal reviews. In addition, the accidents last February revealed that the safety controls at WIP for waste operations may not be adequate for some hazards and accident scenarios. Continuing with safety management programs, the February 2014 events revealed weaknesses in important safety programs such as emergency management, fire protection, and, ma and maintenance. For example, in the area of emergency management, workers and managers did not fully comply with emergency response procedures. Important decisions regarding accident response were left to expert judgment rather than predefined action plans. Training and drill programs were ineffective in maintaining worker competence in accident response. And the emergency management organization was not structured in accordance with DOE requirements. As a result, workers had difficulty evacuating, during, evacuating the underground during the fire event. In addition, the site failed to promptly identify and initiate protective actions during the radiological release. In the area of fire protection, the Accident Investigation Board concluded that the fire hazard analysis did not identify all credible fire scenarios in the underground. Fire protection requirements promulgated by DOE and other regulatory bodies, such as the Mine Safety and Health Administration, were not consistently addressed in program documents, and combustible materials in the underground were routinely in excess of the loading limits established by the program for fire safety. These deficiencies increased the risk of a fire in the WIP underground and complicated efforts to evacuate workers safely. A discipline maintenance program is required to maintain the operational readiness of critical equipment. In this area, the 2014 events revealed a lack of rigor in the development and implementation of WIPS maintenance program. For example, maintenance practices for equipment deviated from vendor recommendations without a technical justification. Routine inspections did not identify hazardous conditions, such as the buildup of combustible fluids on the salt haul trucks. And instrument, sen and instrument sensors were allowed to degrade in WIPS harsh salt environment. Collectively, these issues led the Accident Investigation Board to conclude that NWP did not have an effective contractor assurance system. A healthy contractor assurance system is an important part of DOE's oversight model for defense nuclear facilities. This model relies in part on contractors to self-identify and correct safety issues. The Investigation Board further concluded that DOE had not implemented effective line management oversight of the contractor to identify weaknesses in the contractor assurance system and safety programs. NWP and DOE developed formal corrective action plans to address the findings of the Accident Investigation Board. For example, DOE and NWP were working on a major revision of the documented safety analysis to correct deficiencies in this area. Notably, DOE is committed to applying the 2014 revision of DOE Standard 3009 to the new DSA revision. The revised standard contains significantly improved safety requirements for preparing a documented safety analysis. The staff believes this commitment is a major step forward in improving the safety posture at WIP. DOE's action is particularly commendable because it will be the first application of the revised standard in the DOE complex. To correct the deficiencies in safety management programs and the contractor assurance system, NWP committed to improving program documentation and procedures and conducting additional training for the workforce. NWP is planning reviews in the future to evaluate the effectiveness of these corrective actions. To improve oversight of the contractor, DOE is similarly committed to revising oversight programs and providing additional training for employees. Notably, after the February 2014 events, DOE reorganized the Carlsbad Field Office by creating a separate Office of Operations Oversight. This office segregate, segregates operations, safety, engineering, and environmental oversight from programmatic production activities, thus enhancing oversight independence. 
DOE has been challenged to fill vac vacancies in the new organization, including management positions responsible for safety oversight. DOE is aware of the staffing problem and pursuing options to attract and retain a high-quality federal workforce at WIP. While DOE and the contractor are aggressively working on corrective actions, in most cases it is too early to judge their adequacy. The staff believes, however, that the corrective action plans and commitments provide an adequate framework for improving safety of operations at the WIP site. In the interim, while corrective actions are underway, DOE and the contractor are working to recover the underground and prepare for the resumption of waste operations. Activities at WIP today are focused on restoring the stability of the mine, conducting cleanup and maintenance activities, decontamination, and closing open storage panels as directed by the New Mexico Environment Department. Since the radiological release, the airflow through the underground has been exhausted through high efficiency filters. While necessary to prevent the potential radiological releases to the environment, the filtered ventilation system does not provide sufficient airflow to support all recovery activities or planned waste operations. <clears throat> To support these activities, NWP is pursuing the installation of additional filtered and unfiltered ventilation flow for the contaminated and uncontaminated portions of the underground, respectively. The additional filtered flow will be provided by the interim ventilation system. The additional unfiltered flow will be provided by the supplementary ventilation system. Both systems are planned for installation this year. To compensate for the identified deficiencies in the WIP safety basis, DOE is authorizing recovery activities in the underground including the installation and operation of the interim ventilation system through a series of temporary safety basis documents called evaluations of the safety of the situation or ESSs. Mm -hmm. These ESSs identify the hazards associated with specific recovery activities and the safety controls to protect the workers and the public. While providing the necessary safety basis coverage in accordance with DOE's nuclear safety requirements, ESSs are not a long-term solution for a deficient documented safety analysis. A rigorous documented safety analysis that complies with DOE standards is the only acceptable safety basis solution for WIP. The staff has continued providing oversight of DOE's recovery activities at WIP and the development of the revised documented safety analysis. For example, the staff observed a workshop last month in Carlsbad during which DOE and NWP discussed expectations and plans for implementing the new revision of DOE standard 3009. The staff has also provided oversight of improvements to safety management programs such as emergency preparedness and response. Last December, the staff observed the site's annual site-wide emergency exercise, the first ac activity uh, or the first activity conducted under a reorganized incident command structure. The staff has also observed bi-monthly emergency drills for maintaining worker response proficiency. Finally, the staff has performed focus reviews on the interim ventilation system. While this system is not being designed or procured as a credited safety system, the staff understands that it is DOE's intent to rely upon it as a credited safety system in the documented safety analysis provision. The staff's reviews have therefore focused on understanding the safety, design, and quality requirements applied to the system and the potential gaps that DOE may need to address when the system is upgraded to accredited safety control in the documented safety analysis revision. An additional recent staff activity was to examine the board's historical approach to oversight at WIP in light of the February 2014 events and to identify lessons learned for future oversight activities. The staff has then developed a corrective action plan to address these lessons learned. The lessons learned highlighted several areas needing improvement in staff oversight processes. Of note, the absence of a site representative at WIP diminished our ability to observe WIP operations closely and to detect negative trends that could result in unsafe conditions. Expectations for additional oversight at DOE sites without a site representative were not clearly established. Follow-up review activities with DOE to track identified safety issues to closure needed improvement. This was consistent with a finding of the Accident Investigation Board that deficiencies identified by external agencies such as the DNFSB were allowed to remain unresolved for extended periods of time. Finally, oversight activities at WIP were de-emphasized for the better part of the decade following the start of waste operations at WIP in 1999. The reasons for this lack of emphasis were unclear, but are likely related to the board's limited staffing resources and the relative risk posed by WIP operations in comparison with other hazardous DOE defense nuclear facilities. The staff is implementing corrective actions to address these improvement areas. For example, the staff is maintaining an increased presence at DOE sites without a site representative, including WIP. Technical staff management is deploying headquarters staff, many with field experience as site representatives and qualified for unescorted underground access to, to conduct periodic oversight at WIP on a rotating basis. The headquarters staff has also continued the regular status calls with WIP personnel that began after the accidents to maintain cognizance of recovery activities and to discuss emerging safety concerns. 
Other lessons learned, such as the lack of historical oversight emphasis at WIP and poor follow-up on identified safety issues are being addressed as part of a larger agency effort to improve technical staff internal controls. This effort was underway at the time of the February 2004-14 accidents. As part of this initiative, formal expectations for site cognizant engineers responsible for oversight at DOE sites without a site representative are being established. Formal processes for prioritizing safety reviews, tracking safety issues to closure, and elevating languishing issues for further action are also now in place. The outcomes of the staff's lesson learned analysis and the revised oversight approach codified in our new control system is forming the basis for the staff's future work plans and oversight activities at WIP. Mr. John Pasco, the Nuclear Materials Processing and Stabilization Group lead, will elaborate more on our future plans for providing oversight at WIP during the public meeting portion of this proceeding. This concludes my prepared testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, do you have any questions for Mr. Shuffler? No, I do not. Mr. Santos? No, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Shuffler. Thank you. I would like to introduce the second panel of witnesses who come from the Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management, also referred to as EM, the DOE Carlsbad Field Office, and the WIP site contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, LLC. With the panel members, please take your seats at the witness table as I introduce you. Mr. James Hutton is the DOE Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety, Security, and Quality Programs, NEM. Mr. Joe Franco is the current DOE Carlsbad Field Office Manager. Mr. Sean Donegan is the DOE Carlsbad Field Office Senior WIP Recovery Manager. And Mr. Robert McQuinn is the Nuclear Waste Partnership President and Project Manager. And Mr. James Blankenhorn is the Nuclear Waste Partnership Recovery and Deputy Project Manager. Uh, thank you, sirs. The board will direct questions to the panel or to individual panelists who will answer them to the best of their ability. After initial answers, other panelists may then seek recognition by the chair to supplement the answer as necessary. If panelists would like to, make, to take a question for the record, the answer to that question will be entered into the record of this hearing at a later time. Uh, does anyone on the panel, I, I understand you all have statements, I just reemphasize we are happy to take your, your statements for the record, uh, but if you'd like to make a brief, make a brief spoken statement, uh, we'd be happy to, to hear that as well too, and we'll start with you, Mr. Hutton. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chairman Roberson, uh, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Santos. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss WIP today. In my view, the most important thing that must occur in order for us to restart operations at WIP is to reestablish the safety envelope of the facility, including both the documented safety analysis and safety management programs. After the events of February 14th, inadequacies in the WIP safety basis were identified as a result of executing the department's unreviewed safety question process as described in the department's rule 10 CFR 830 nuclear safety management. DOE began implementing operational restrictions and compensatory measures at WIP to ensure controls for confinement of radioactive material continued to protect workers, the environment, and members of the public. To compensate for these safety basis inadequacies and allow recovery activities to move forward, the contractor developed and CBFO approved a series of temporary safety basis documents called Evaluations of the Safety of the Situation, ESSs. Recovery activities have been specifically authorized by CBFO through the ESS process. These included initial reentry into the underground and other recovery tasks such as ground control in the underground. The CBFO staff, supplemented by DOE headquarters personnel and others from across the complex perform oversight to ensure the requirements of the ESSs are properly implemented. As described in the corrective action plans for the accident reports, DOE is taking a number of actions regarding improving the safety culture at WIP. A safety culture assistance visit at WIP was conducted with team members from the commercial nuclear industry, NRC, NASA, and the DOE complex. The team developed recommendations which both the contractor and CBFO will use to help improve the safety culture at WIP. DOE has also conducted training and leadership for a safety conscious work environment for senior leaders at CBFO and the contractor, and one of the pilot sessions for DOE's first line supervisor course was conducted at Carlsbad. The WIP DSA revision 5 will require CBFO approval and my concurrence. EM has directed the contractor to use the 2014 revision of DOE standard 3009 for this update to clearly establish expectations and requirements. A safety basis review team has been established that is co-led by the CBFO Nuclear Safety Senior Technical Advisor, Jeff Carswell, 
and the EM Headquarters Chief Safety Officer, Dr. Robert Nelson. The EM Headquarters Director of the Office of Safety Management, Todd LaPointe, serves as a senior advisor to the Safety Basis Review Team. With respect to emergency management and response, EM Headquarters conducted a site visit in December 2014 in order to assess WIPS progress in improving its emergency management capability. We reviewed the site's emergency responders, mine rescue team's capabilities, incident command training, emergency classification and categorization, as well as the emergency operations center configuration and communication capability with the DOE watch office, including the emergency management critical elements. We identified a number of opportunities for improvement and some objectives we felt were not satisfactorily met. We are currently following up with the site on corrective actions and improvement suggestions we have provided. DOE Headquarters Fire Protection Resources have been working with CBFO Fire Protection and NWP Contractor Resources to understand and clarify the interdependency between the baseline needs assessment and Mine Safety and Health Administration requirements. In my view, there is no conflict between DOE, NFPA, and MSHA requirements. Most recently, NWP briefed CBFO on proposed changes to the BNA, to the baseline needs assessment, including the underground fire fighting strategy. Once NWP submits the proposed BNA, DOE will review it and act accordingly. EM's expectation is that our facility maintenance and engineering programs must be effective in keeping critical structures, systems, and components in a high state of operational readiness. We view this as a key component of ensuring the safety of our workers and facilities. Finally, corrective action plans have been developed by NWP, CBFO, and EM headquarters in response to the fire and phase one accident investigation reports. Corrective action plan development for the phase two report is in progress. We require an update on the corrective action status monthly. EM will require a review of the effectiveness of the corrective actions once they are complete. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Hutton. Mr. Franco? Good, good afternoon, Vice Chairman. I'm Joe Franco. I'm the Carlsbad field office manager. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to address the board today. As a CBFO manager, I have overall responsibility for WIP, and I'm here to tell you that the last 14 months have been particularly uh, challenging for me. Despite those challenges, I believe we have made significant strides and are well on our way to recovering the facility and restarting waste and placement thanks to our dedicated workforce. The WIP recovery plan that was issued on September 30th, 2014 identified seven key elements as a strategy to safely resume in placing waste at WIP. The first key element, safety, is a paramount to the overall recovery strategy. Immediately following the February events, actions were taken to secure and stabilize the plant, restrict on-site access to essential personnel, assess site conditions and status, and evaluate potential radiological releases and potential exposures to uh, personnel. As we, began our, our, as we began our internal uh, analysis of the events, we initiated the deployment of new management and uh, corporate subject matter experts to perform independent evaluation of safety management programs and implementation of comp measures to address any deficiencies. A number of inadequacies as have been identified by, as you heard from Mr. Whitney and Mr. Hutton, uh, were in the safety management programs associated with the uh, incident. So I will not cover that in this testimony. I, I will put it in my record. For the sep second topic, federal oversight, CBFO has made significant progress during the past 12 months in enhancing both the structure and effectiveness of oversight. Judgment of need 24 from the FARP uh, event AIB report identified the need for CBFO to establish and implement an effective line management oversight program process that would meet the requirements for DOE Order 226.1B. When Bravo, implementation of Department of Energy oversight policy. The previous CBFO organization had a number of positions which shared responsibilities in both the program management, which is cost schedule and, um, and scope, and contractor oversight. So each individual had multiple hats that they were wearing at the time. With these shared responsibilities, staff were, on, were not able to fully focus in one a specific area and have a subject matter expert in that area. CBFO reorganized and segregated contractor oversight from program management, and the result was the creation of the two new offices, the Office of Program Management and the Office of Operations Oversight. A, a thing to note that I wanted to make sure I stated was that this was something that was in process prior to the events. We had recognized that uh, 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 issue that we had. New positions created in the Office of Program Management are intended to ensure that the cost, scope, and schedule for all CBFO activities are fully integrated and managed successfully through recovery and throughout the expected life cycle of the facility. 
In the Office of Operations Oversight, new facility rep represented positions were created and include, uh, included in there. We also included positions for radiological protection, industrial hygiene, confinement ventilation, which is a, a critical, as we've heard, for the ventilation systems, mine safety, technical qualifications and training, nuclear safety, and work control positions to increase CBFO oversight capabilities. Initially, as a stopgap measure, what we were able to obtain highly qualified personnel from around the DOE complex on detail to WIP. As of today, 50% of the new CBFO positions have been filled. The organization is undergoing this positive culture change to be better equipped for addressing both the program management and oversight needs as it works its way through the WIP recovery and the resumption of transgenic waste disposal operations safely. I also wanted to discuss some of the actions that have been taken or are planned to correct emergency management program deficiencies. Immediately after the February 2014 events, an independent assessment of the emergency management program was performed, utilizing corporate reach back and subject matter experts across the DOE complex. Gaps identified from this assessment and findings from the Accident Investigation Board Fire and Radiological Release Phase 1 reports were consolidated to define the corrective action plans required to establish a healthy and compliant emergency management program. The actions within the plan were subsequently uh, approved by CBFO. In the interim, comp measures were uh, put in place and are implemented throughout the use of evaluation safety of the situation. The emergency management program has been restructured to align with the, na the current National Incident Management System, NIMS, and the Incident Command System principles, concepts, and terminology. This allows for a well-managed and coordinated response as well as a seamless integration in external agencies that provide WIP mutual aid support. These changes include restructuring the Emergency Operations Center staff positions as well as development of new training and qualification programs for each position which integrates Nuclear Waste Partnership and CBFO senior management into the process. There have also been significant program enhancements to assist emergency management decision makers with emergency categorization and classification and timely emergency notifications to local, state, and federal agencies that you all have mentioned was uh, lacking previously. Furthermore, there has been a complete rewrite of emergency management policies, emergency plans and procedures, as well as significant upgrades made to the emergency equipment, systems, and facilities to ensure an adequate response and coordination of any WIP incident. A revitalization of the emergency management drill and exercise program has been completed to ensure consistency in drill and exercise planning, documentation, conduct, and after action reporting, which has significantly enhanced the overall quality and rigor of the program. The drill and exercise program is a combination of self-assessments, validate the adequacy of plans, procedures, training, equipment, and systems, and overall program health. The program enhancements to date are only a start in an ongoing cycle of preparedness that will drive continuous program improvements. And that's all I have for right now. Thank you, sir. Mr. Donegan, we can take it for the record, or you can summarize, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chairman and Board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, today, I wanted to speak to you with about the. Per uh, all right. Today, I'd like to provide some additional details regarding the progress we have made at the Carlsbad Field Office relative to contractor oversight during the recovery phase activities. As recovery manager, one of my responsibilities is ensuring that there is sufficient review, direction, validation, and recovery functions, as well as responses to judgments of needs identified by the DOE's Accident Investigation Board. DOE is controlling risk of activities to recover the underground and compensating when needed for safety deficiencies relative to re revealed by the February 2014 events and subsequent activities. Immediately following the events at the WIP site, work activities were curtailed and underground access was restricted. Limited reentry into the underground and limited work activities have been highly scrutinized on a case by case basis by DOE through the evaluation of the safety of the situation process. DOE will continue to use the, this activity based work screening approach until the new documented safety analysis revision 5 is fully implemented. Through this approach, DOE is able to adequately control the risk of the activities. As a follow up to one of the judgments of need, as Mr. Franco just mentioned, CBFO restructured their organization to include the Office of Operations Oversight. The objective was to segregate operations, safety, engineering, and environmental oversight for WIP facility operations from a programmatic productive production activities to enhance oversight independence, particularly through the recovery phase. I believe it is important to note that prior to the resumption of waste and placement operations, the department will conduct a full op operational readiness review. 
This review will ensure readiness of the facility and personnel to restart the facility within the bounds of acceptable risks defined by the safety basis authorization and ensure the facility has adequate safety management programs implemented and sufficient controls in place to start waste and placement operations within those bounds. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McQueen. Okay, um, maintenance and work control. With years of nuclear experience from Pantex, Savannah River, Lawrence Livermore, and Hanford. And this was a strategic decision uh, in order to use experience from other sites and lessons learned that, that have a more mature uh, nuclear safety culture than ours currently is. Significant improvements have been made to conduct of engineering with uh, what would be an expected emphasis on cognizant system engineering, which was missing previously. As an example, we've incorporated into the annual system engineer walk-down procedure a new, previously not existing, structured approach for system health reports, which are now briefed to, uh, to me on a monthly basis and uh, include my senior team. These reports, as you would expect from other mature uh, projects, form the basis for identifying and addressing emerging system deficiencies and trends, particularly my safety credited systems. One other example of conduct of engineering improvement is uh, my requirement that the fire impairment process be modified to require my fire protection engineer review and approval of compensatory measures, which did not previously exist, and to use my engineering organization to drive to my level the timely resolution of important systems like fire protection. Finally, WIP's job hazard analysis process has been enhanced. Uh, through a work planning and control process that I'm sure we'll talk about at uh, length this afternoon to expand its thoroughness in the process checklist used in the walk down and planning phases which now engage the worker and I look forward to talking to you more about my uh, vision for that. I require executive review and approval of the high hazard work evolutions and through our re-entries I led the safety management reviews of all high hazard work control documents and I required, we'll talk more about this, that the field work supervisor and all the workers who are going to be involved personally delivered to me in a formal review process uh, exactly what they were going to do in order to assure myself that their work had been, their involvement had been included. So that's an overview of what will go into the testimony and that completes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. McQuinn. And Mr. Blankenhorn. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chairman and members of the board. I'm Jim Blankenhorn, the Nuclear Waste Partnership Recovery Manager and Deputy Project Manager. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board today and discuss WIP recovery and safety. I'll be de detailing how worker and public safety is protected during WIP recovery activities by compensatory measures that have Im been implemented while we strengthen our safety management programs. Immediately following the February events, independent assessments of each safety management program utilizing industry subject matter experts were performed for identification of weaknesses and gaps from the requirements. Compensatory measures were immediately put in place to address these gaps and weaknesses. In addition to compensatory measures, corrective actions have been developed to address findings from the safety management program independent assessments and from the Accident Investigation Board fire and radiological release phase one reports. Implementation and documentation of the closure of each corrective action will be verified through a line management assessment scheduled for this summer. Effectiveness reviews will be validated through the conduct of NWP self-assessments later in this fiscal year. A management self-assessment will be conducted to verify compliance and full implementation of the safety management programs and to declare readiness to perform contractor and DOE operational readiness reviews. As part of the proceedings today, I look forward to discussing the actions taken to enable recovery activities and to provide specific discussion on actions related to restoring trust and confidence, establishing emergency preparedness and response programs to ensure workers in the underground can safely evacuate the mine in the event of an emergency, improving and emphasizing work planning and work control, the establishment of a consistent and enduring nuclear safety culture, reestablishing strong disciplined operations, retraining the workforce and revising our programs and procedures to operate safely in both contaminated and uncontaminated conditions and areas. Thank you again, Madam Vice Chairman. We are now ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you all. We will take your full statements for the record. Thank you all for your comments. 
Now we're going to start uh, for a question, and I'm actually going to start. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Dunning. You have huge shoulders in the job that you have uh, accepted. The, the WIP recovery plan describes the key activities that must be completed to meet the goal or the plan date for resuming waste operations. These activities include resuming ground control, bolting, closing panel six and panel seven, room seven, increasing ventilation flow through multiple steps I think you've laid out, completing surveys, cleanup and maintenance activities, decontaminating portions of the underground, completing readiness reviews and obtaining regulatory approvals. Did I get them all? I believe so. Is there another big one I missed? No, ma'am. So which of these are you find the do you view as the most challenging? And, and along with that, what kind of risk management strategy are you going to employ to ensure that their success and these remain integrated? Well, each of the key areas that you just identified presents its own unique challenges, to be sure. Um, all of them are very important and keys to safety and the recovery of the website as well. The one that I would personally consider to be the most challenging, in my opinion, would be the ventilation. And the reason I say that is because it is a fundamental shift in the way that we have operated from the past. Prior to the incidents, um, whip ventilation in the underground was not filtered. It was operating at a roughly 420,000 cubic feet per minute. Uh, following the incidents, uh, we have maintained constant HEPA filtration mode since then, operating at about 60,000 cubic feet per minute, um, which reduces the amount of work activities that can go on in the underground because filtration or ventilation, excuse me, is necessary for everything from life sustainability to the underground mining and bolting um, to waste and placement activities, anything that goes on there, it, as well as the diesel equipment operation and removing the diesel particulate. So we are going to implement the three-phase approach to improve the ventilation system. As discussed earlier for, through several different people, the first one is the interim ventilation system, which is going to take the cubic feet from 60,000 cubic feet per minute up to roughly 114,000 cubic feet per minute, per, per minute. And all of that will be under HEPA filtration. Uh, the second phase would be the supplemental ventilation, which would increase it again to 180,000 cubic feet per minute. But that would introduce two circuits, if you would, into the WIP environment, one for the contaminated area, one for the uncontaminated area. The third phase will be the permanent ventilation, which will take years to implement. The reason I consider this to be the most challenging is because prior to the events, we hadn't operated in HEPA filtration mode. We're doing that continuously now. The interim ventilation system will continually operate in that mode. The supplemental ventilation system will operate at the same time on a different circuit. Um, so this is a paradigm shift in the way that ventilation has been done in the past, and that's why I consider this to be the most challenging. We are overseeing this from a DOE perspective in a number of ways. We are continuously interacting with the contractor Mr. Blankenhorn is my counterpart, um, to ensure that the processes that they're installing, the procedures, and um, the adequate engineering are involved to make sure that the circuits will operate correctly, that the bulkheads and the dampers will sufficiently isolate one circuit from the other in terms of the SVS through the IVS. Um, we have an IPT, an integrated project team, which we meet weekly and we discuss these topics. We discuss issues that are coming up. We discuss uh, mitigation strategies. We discuss ways that we can improve it and things that we can do looking forward into the future so that we can resume safe operations. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, so you're the, the really DOE's local face for the recovery. Do you have, would there be any hesitancy on your part if you thought you were pushing faster than you could really assure safety with raising that to your management? No, ma'am. For three reasons. Um, okay. One, as Mr. Whitney mentioned in the first session, we have a tremendous amount of support all the way up to the Secretary of Energy in ensuring that safety is the priority for the WIP site and resuming operations. Schedule is a very, very distant part of that. Safety has priority over everything else. On another note, we, op we have the operations of oversight, the change in the organizational structure, which provides more safety, I believe, oversight in my opinion, than there had been in the past because there's not the confusion between oversight and program management. There's not the uh, tendency to focus on schedule and program management rather than oversight. Mm -hmm. And the third reason for me personally that I would say that um, I absolutely have safety the first in mind is because I am locally from Carlsbad. Um, I have a beautiful family, young children, and in addition to the coworkers and the environment and the public, 
I have an innate sense of responsibility to them to ensure that they will, that the mine will recover safely before any kind of scheduled conflicts. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Franco, what are you, how are you communicating with the workforce in general at WIP so that Mr. Dunnigan doesn't have to make those tough choices? What kind of risk management strategy are you going to employ to ensure that their success and these remain integrated? Well, each of the key areas that you just identified presents its own unique challenges, to be sure. Um, all of them are very important and keys to safety and the recovery of the website as well. The one that I would personally consider to be the most challenging, in my opinion, would be the ventilation. And the reason I say that is because it is a fundamental shift in the way that we have operated from the past. Prior to the incidents, um, whip ventilation in the underground was not filtered. It was operating at a roughly 420,000 cubic feet per minute. Uh, following the incidents, uh, we have maintained constant HEPA filtration mode since then, operating at about 60,000 cubic feet per minute, um, which reduces the amount of work activities that can go on in the underground because filtration or ventilation, excuse me, is necessary for everything from life sustainability to the underground mining and bolting. Um, to waste and placement activities, anything that goes on and run it, as well as the diesel equipment operation and removing the diesel particulate. So we are going to implement the three-phase approach to improve the ventilation system. As discussed earlier for, through several different people, the first one is the interim ventilation system, which is going to take the cubic feet from 60,000 cubic feet per minute up to roughly 114,000 cubic feet per minute, per, per minute, and all of that will be under HEPA filtration. Uh, the second phase would be the supplemental ventilation, which would increase it again to 180,000 cubic feet per minute. But that would introduce two circuits, if you would, into the WIP environment, one for the contaminated area, one for the uncontaminated area. The third phase will be the permanent ventilation, which will take years to implement. The reason I consider this to be the most challenging is because prior to the events, we hadn't operated in HEPA filtration mode. We're doing that continuously now. The interim ventilation system will continually operate in that mode. The supplemental ventilation system will operate at the same time on a different circuit. Um, so this is a paradigm shift in the way that ventilation has been done in the past, and that's why I consider this to be the most challenging. We are overseeing this from a DOE perspective in a number of ways. We are continuously interacting with the contractor, Mr. Blankenhorn is my counterpart, um, to ensure that the processes that they're installing, the procedures, and um, the adequate engineering are involved to make sure that the circuits will operate correctly that the bulkheads and the dampers will sufficiently isolate one circuit from the other in terms of the SVS through the IVS. Um, we have an IPT, an integrated project team, which we meet weekly and we discuss these topics. We discuss issues that are coming up. We discuss uh, mitigation strategies. We discuss ways that we can improve it and things that we can do looking forward into the future so that we can resume safe operations. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, so you're the the really DOE's local face for the recovery. Do you have, would there be any hesitancy on your part if you thought you were pushing faster than you could really assure safety with raising that to your management? No, ma'am, for three reasons. Um, okay. One, as Mr. Whitney mentioned in the first session, we have a tremendous amount of support all the way up to the Secretary of Energy in ensuring that safety is the priority for the WIP site and resuming operations. Schedule is a very, very distant part of that. Safety has priority over everything else. On another note, we, op we have the operations of oversight, the change in the organizational structure, which provides more safety, I believe, oversight in my opinion, than there had been in the past because there's not the confusion between oversight and program management. There's not the uh, tendency to focus on schedule and program management rather than oversight. And the third reason for me personally that I would say that um, I absolutely have safety the first in mind is because I am locally from Carlsbad. Um, I have a beautiful family, young children, and in addition to the coworkers and the environment and the public, I have an innate sense of responsibility to them to ensure that they will, that the mine will recover safely before any kind of schedule conflicts. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Franco, what are you, how are you communicating with the workforce in general at WIP so that Mr. Dunnigan doesn't have to make those tough choices? Yeah, so, um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, the, one of the things that uh, we as in the, in the Carlsbad Field Office, uh, it's important for me, and I did this from the very beginning. I started here in 2012. 
that my my role for the department here uh, with my for my workforce is that I'm their cheerleader I will take their messages up and I will defend the messages um, similar to uh, uh, the, the comments that were made by mr. Sean Dunnigan here I also have family here uh, we I have family that works out at the whip facility and I have a uh, family that were in the underground during the events so to me it touches home that we have to and it's my job to make sure that my management team and headquarters does not forget what happened at the facility and push schedule ahead of safety and I, I can tell you that from Moniz on all the way down we have had tremendous support on that very topic thank you sir mr. Sullivan thank you um, I have some questions uh, that I will ask to various members of this uh, panel about uh, the evaluations of the safety of the situation and how those interact with the um, documented safety analysis and safety management programs but I'd like to start uh, by asking uh, Mr. McQuinn for maybe a little bit of public education since this is a public hearing people are listening heard all those terms already thank you just take a, a minute or so and as briefly as possible explain the difference in these things what there's three specific things we have documented safety analysis evaluations of the safety of the situation and safety management programs okay the um, there are two equally important documents that are the basis for our nuclear safety program and they're known as a documented safety analysis and then flowing out of the documented safety analysis are the very specific requirements called technical safety requirements and we uh, we comply with those rigorously I have 17 safety management programs that are named in both the DSA and have dedicated chapters in the technical safety requirements that basically uh, form the basis for formality of operations and conduct of operations and we've already named a number of those conduct of maintenance conduct of engineering conduct of operations so that is our normal basis and uh, I'm held accountable to implement that rigorously and if I find myself not to be in compliance then to follow a process of reporting that and evaluating uh, the cause of that non-compliance and fixing that um, when I arrived um, on March 16 Sunday March 16 I found that uh, there were some fundamental gaps at that moment some inadequacies that we typically call either potential inadequacies of our safety analysis or positive unreviewed safety questions and those those terms aren't intuitively obvious but I found a particular gap with respect to the filtration systems classification and uh, a number of other issues and so Joe and I together that very first week I was here wrote the first temporary safety basis it happens to have the name evaluation of safety of the situation but it's a temporary safety basis that's authorized by the department's directives so that first week we implemented a very wrote and approved and implemented a very important temporary safety basis ESS 1 now to speed forward I've written a total of eight of these ESS's and uh, and they all exist and I'm required to be in compliance with them all today and as uh, we've re reported in our testimony they are a necessary part of our basis to drive recovery until um, the new revision revision 5 to the DSA and the TSRs is completed and approved and implemented and uh, we'll talk a lot more about that but that is a fundamentally important activity but in the meantime uh, these temporary safety basis are an important foundation for us All right <clears throat> Oh, thank you for that now so um, in the ideal world the way it's supposed to be or way it would normally would be uh, except for these accidents we would have had a rigorous and complete documented safety analysis uh, but today we now have the documented safety analysis uh, which then gives us our TSRs as you explained and you, we also have uh, eight uh, ESS's evaluation of the safety situation it seems like there's a lot of documents out there is it, are these coordinated we we uh, we haven't any issues with uh, having the workforce be able to 
move from one to the other and and have all of the requirements uh, laid out so that they can follow them. I mean, my, my experience is when you have things in many different places, it's easy to look at one and miss something that's in another. Can you speak to that, please? Okay, uh, a couple of additional terms, and I won't um, uh, belabor them, but just to use the, the directive terms. So I'm required to maintain accurately what's called a safety basis list. And so in a perfect world, there would just be two documents on that list, the, the documented safety analysis and the technical safety requirements. But now I have a more complicated list. And so I have, um, I have many documents, including these eight um, evaluations of safety of the situation. And we are managing that list rigorously. Uh, but complex is not necessarily good. And, um, and so we take that that issue uh, of configuration management very seriously. Now let me, let me speak about the workers. And so it's my engineering and nuclear safety organization that manage that list and its rigor. And I'm, I'm very comfortable and confident in that. These uh, temporary safety bases, um, we wrote those uh, for particular needs, starting with habitability. But then as we executed the initial entries underground, we wrote new or revised ESSs to authorize those activities. And, and as an example, the, my authorization to close panels six and seven are defined in these ESSs. Now, um, you didn't bring it up, but let me bring it up. Um, I had a violation of one of my ESSs last Monday, uh, a week ago Monday. And I took that seriously. And as we, have, we reported that and evaluated that, uh, we made note that over the last nine months, this was the fourth uh, non-compliance with this suite of temporary safety bases. And so we stopped and uh, we did a root cause analysis, an initial root cause analysis. And, uh, and I required last week then that we, we go and look at the implementation of all eight of these temporary safety documents. And as a result of that Sunday night, I made a decision and starting this past Monday morning, we began a daily series of work pauses across the whole organization. And ultimately this week, I've made a decision that I'm going to consolidate and revise these eight temporary safety documents. Now that, that wasn't an easy decision because I don't want to lose focus on the, the most important task of rewriting the, the foundational documents but we'll be in this mode perhaps for another nine months or so. And so I'm going to make, I made a conservative decision. Uh, Mr. Franco supported me in that. And uh, we're going to take the time uh, to improve these temporary safety bases. Um, and if that affects schedule, then so be it. But uh, ultimately, uh, there are some uh, weaknesses in those documents that we will address. And, and, um, and ultimately, there's some complexities in them that make it difficult to implement rigorously. And I'm going to take the complexity out and we're going to simplify and make it, uh, make it simpler for the frontline workers to understand and implement the controls. Well, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Hutton, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, so, as uh, Mr. McQuinn was just explaining, uh, they have eight of these uh, ESSs. They had, uh, so now it had a number of documents and now they've found some, some issues which actually sounds to me like a glass half full. Um, you know, we, we prefer to find no issues, but if there are issues, uh, at least the, uh, the contractor in this case is finding them themselves and, and taking action. And, and that, that sounds good to me. Uh, so my question for you is, what is the guidance that comes out of the DOE headquarters? Uh, were, were they, was there direction to do a, uh, eight separate ones or do them as necessary, uh, coordinate. Did you, was any guidance provided from the, uh, from the headquarters of the Department of Energy on how this safety basis evolution, and I think this is an evolution, right? We had a safety basis before. Ultimately, we will have one coordinated document sometime in the future, and this is the transition phase. Uh, was there any guidance given on how this was supposed to be done? Yes, the, uh, the guidance principally is contained in the department's nuclear safety rule, TEDSFAR 830. And, and what it requires is this. When inadequacies in the safety basis are identified, then uh, the contractor is required to immediately uh, place operational restrictions on the facility to place it in a safe condition. They're required to notify DOE. They're required to then 
perform an unreviewed safety question determination uh, around that inadequacy to see if it is bound by the existing safety basis or not. Um, and finally, uh, they're not allowed to remove those operational restrictions that they put in place until an evaluation of the safety of the situation has been performed. So that's where it comes from. And, and so, uh, you know, exactly whether the contractor chooses to write one document or two or three, you know, is not, is not uh, specified. Um, the, uh, uh, what, what we require is that uh, when the safety basis is inadequate, before we undertake activities, for instance, re-entering the underground, you know, following these events, uh, we require that uh, controls be in place adequate to protect the workers, the public, and the environment. And so if the safety basis or the safety management program implementation has been inadequate, uh, those, con you know, temporary controls need to be put in place in order to allow those activities to occur. And of course, those activities need to occur, you know, in some period of time because uh, otherwise, you know, eventually the, the underground, you know, wouldn't be recoverable if we, if we waited long enough to do that. But, but it's got to be done right. I think it was done uh, methodically. Um, you know, then those requirements, you know, have to be implemented in a rigorous and disciplined manner. The procedures have to be maintained that implement those requirements. Uh, those procedures have to be executed reliably and, and repeatedly in the course of, of the work that goes on. And, uh, and that can be challenging, you know, uh, it's challenging at, at all the facilities. Uh, uh, I think mostly the folks that are, you know, working directly from the ESS documents themselves, as, as Bob alluded to, are the engineering nuclear safety folks. They're the ones who, you know, produce the procedures that then the operators execute or the, you know, other folks uh, in the facility execute. Okay. <clears throat> Do you think the guidance is adequate, though? Uh, you, we have guidance that uh, addresses a situation where there's an issue raised with the documented safety analysis. I guess I'm not, I'm wondering if the guidance is accurate for a case where you've actually had an accident. So you go from a scenario where uh, we had a facility and we had a documented safety analysis for that, and now we really don't have the same facility anymore because of the accident. In this case, um, we had ventilation for a mine that wasn't contaminated and was never intended to be contaminated. Now it's contaminated. So it's really not the same facility anymore. Um, it's a different situation, certainly. Right. And so uh, that could happen um, somewhere else, a uh, different facility. Um, and it, you know, with any accident, presumably the accident would leave the facility not in the same condition that it was uh, before the accident. So I guess my question to you is, is is this guidance specific enough? Uh, sounds to me like um, the contractor was uh, given some guidance on what to do, but the contractor chose a course of action and now they're shifting to a different course of action to uh, try to lessen the complexity by putting everything together. Do you think the guidance that you have is, uh, is specific enough? I, I think that it is adequate, uh, actually. Uh, there's an you know, you get into the unreviewed safety question process, and DOE has a guide on how to implement that. It's extensive. It's detailed. I, I think, uh, I think there's adequate guidance. You know, it's not going to be specific to any one particular facility or any one particular situation, because they're all different. But uh, I, I guess I think it is adequate. Yes. Okay, Mr. Franco, uh, the role that uh, your organization plays in uh, in this process. Uh, Again, uh, the process going from the documented safety analysis that we had before to the one we're going to have in the future and whatever we have as a temporary measure. I'd like to add, you know, uh, when um, we uh, encountered the, the situation with the events, um, we, uh, the stabilization of the facility was key. And so when we looked at and saw that uh, the safety basis was inadequate, uh, the initial uh, uh, view was that we, we needed to put uh, something in place that reassured us that we were uh, safely protecting our workforce and and uh, the public and the environment. And so that's where ESS-01 came into play. Now, from that point on, um, myself and Bob McQuinn and, and Jim Hutton actually had many uh, discussions about 
the the full you know where were we going to end at the at the end and we knew we were going to have to rewrite the the document of safety analysis there's going to have to be a full rewrite now in the interim uh, as you remember when uh, we started this process and um, we also had uh, 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 your staff was there helping us through this process as we went through this process we uh, identified what are the phases that we need to do to get to certain things you know we needed to get in the underground we needed to evaluate what is actually happening in the underground and so we wanted to take various ESS's to drive us through that uh, because we didn't know this condition in the underground we still didn't know what actually had happened that got us to this uh, where we were at the time uh, we knew we had an, an event in the underground that uh, was with the true waste uh, there was a lot of speculation that ranged from you know a roof roof failure all the way and, and so we evaluated all of those things as we started to enter the mine in a methodical process and knew we knew that we were going to have various ESS's to, to help us guide us through and make sure that we had covered all the safety bases the mine was in a different configuration we had just had to fire all of the SCSCRs you know the sale all of those had been used and were brought to uh, the station so it wasn't like you could go down there and everything was still in the same configuration so we we actually took a very methodical approach utilizing these ESS's uh, knowing that there's a risk also when you have so many of these and you add all of these requirements close to 100 requirements in there on how we're implementing today the rigor of that is still important for us to to make sure that we have this cross-functional so I believe the decisions that we've made today uh, taking our time making sure we're doing these methodically going through the various ESS's uh, and making sure that each exercise and event that we uh, activity that we start to perform in the underground is evaluated separately and uh, until we get to the final documented safety analysis I believe this is the right approach okay and uh, Mr. Blankenhorn uh, are you responsible for taking these ESS's and then making sure that they get into each and uh, every whether it's a safety management program or work procedure that that they get appropriately flowed down into those specific documents that the workers will use is that correct yes mr. Sullivan thank you the the process uh, that we utilize once CBFO uh, has approved the documents we then go through an independent verification process that uh, that maps the individual controls to the implementing documentation um, and then we capture that information uh, on the linking document database uh, which then gives us a ready reference on where the references and where the controls themselves are captured uh, and then the organization goes through uh, training and qualifications and then uh, a uh, an oral board type process with the folks that are responsible for implementing um, and we, that that's all then done under under an IVS process that's then uh, once it's complete and the results are finalized and that goes back up through the management chain for approval then to implement um, the ESS as it's been as it's been approved okay so if we just take the uh, mr. McQuinn referred to a violation that occurred last week if we just take that as an example um, where was the breakdown was it in the the flow down of the requirements was it in the training the qualification where was the breakdown on that one yeah unfortunately the the methodology that we had chosen um, uh, to be our our implementing process was was the linking document database um, and in that process uh, there were a number of implementing documents uh, that we had made some mistakes on in terms of how we populated this this linking document database uh, and, and there were also uh, some issues with interpretation as as the organization took the requirements out of the ESS and translated them into the work documents themselves there were some translations that were made and, and the full intent of the control then were not fully captured in the implementing documents and so as we went through and did the extent of conditions reviews that, that uh, mr. McQuinn referred to we identified a number of those instances both in the implementing documents and the linking document database and so we've put in place some controls now to uh, to address those issues to train and qualify the workforce as well as to make those uh, those corrections 
and we put uh, some additional compensatory measures in place while, while we're in the process of going through and making those enhancements to the program. Okay, so Mr. McQueen, uh, I'm sorry, you want to add something? Could, could I add a thought, Mr. Sullivan? Because um, it's important. It's one of the it was one of the important causes with respect to the events. Uh, when I arrived, there there was not a contractor or performance assurance organization. There was one individual who coordinated issues management, and I now am building a 15-person uh, contractor assurance organization. Now, let me relate that back to uh, the importance of uh, these these controls in the temporary safety bases. So, when we wrote each temporary safety bases and operations and engineering implemented. It's an important lesson learned from around the conflicts uh, of, of independent verification. And, uh, and we did independent verification, but I, I used members of the operations organization to do that. And ultimately, I believed it to be fully adequate. And this past week, I've concluded that, that it wasn't independent enough. And so I've, I've decided and declared that all of my future implementation, all future independent reviews will be, do, be done through my new contractor assurance organization and contractor assurance system. So in that case, that line of defense, um, which I believe to be adequate, uh, was not. But I'll fix that through the, the rollout of my new contractor assurance function. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Santos. Thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Um, I have several questions, follow-up questions. I'll start with uh, Mr. Franco. Um, looking at the uh, technical assessment report and their conclusions regarding their, the, uh, the particular drum that had the, the release, it is my understanding that there's still several uh, drums with a similar composition uh, in the underground which may have the possibility of, a, of another release. Um, can you explain to the public um, in detail how, how the publics and the workers are being protected in the potential event of another drum release, please? Yes, I can. Uh, we have taken uh, measures to make sure from the time of the event, um, once we d d identified that it was a, a drum from the Los Alamos office that um, had uh, caused the event, uh, we took a um, a conservative approach and, and had put the city safety basis items in place to and, and the work instructions to make sure that uh, we put all the proper protective equipment for our personnel depending on where they were going to be in the mine um, also to uh, support any activities um, so before any work is done in any of the contaminated areas in the underground there's a very rigorous uh, work control process that's Com completed for that approach. Now, what I can tell you also is that before anybody goes in the underground, we also took a lot of effort and, uh, uh, and, and changed the program. We talked about the emergency response program earlier, that that was one of the SMPs that needed to be upgraded. And so what we did is we made sure, before we even went into the clean area of the mine, uh, that we had a robust system in place for the evacuation and accountability. So we had continuous air monitors put in the underground for early detection and being able to evacuate uh, personnel that were in the clean area also. You know, we continue to do the uh, exercises and drills to make sure that they can evacuate and, um, and the training that goes on with, with that approach. Also, every work instruction has a job hazard. There's a pre-briefing on a daily basis that covers all of the work activity that's going to be performed in the underground and very specifically addressed by each uh, supervisor that's going to go perform that activity. For the underground part of actually going into the contaminated area and going by where the containers are, that it has another set of rigor that goes with it. And that rigor is contained in the radiological work permit that ties into um, looking at what is the potential for an, an actual act, uh, event. The personnel have monitoring devices that they carry with them that they're going when as they're going, and they also have respiratory protection. There are always um, uh, upstream of the airflow for the underground. Now, the ventilation system is in ventilation and filtration, as we talked, and that's not going to change anymore. And so during, if you have an event, it's still in the filtration. That airflow is not changing and remains to the back. The, the uh, uh, emergency notification systems and the um, instrumentation the individual have and the training that they received is for immediate evacuation of the area and going up to the evacuation at the 
uh, egress hoist station, uh, which is a waste hoist for normally, and the salt hoist is secondary. So, so I would like to f follow up. You, you mentioned uh, continuous air monitors. Um, it is my understanding that it was a continuous air monitor located in the underground that detected the uh, radiological release and initiated the shift in the ventilation from unfiltered to filter. Uh, but had the event happened, let's say February 12th, two days before the event, uh, that might not have been in place and the uh, release could have been uh, more significant. Is my understanding correct? That is correct. So what sort of, uh, have, have the requirements regarding continuous air monitoring changed since the uh, event? And if so, can you elaborate in some of those details? Yes, and, and that, as, as we've been talking about the ESS is that we've captured uh, where the requirements have changed for the continuous air monitors. Now, station B, uh, that's the effluent coming out after the HEPA uh, filtration side. Uh, that station did not have a continuous air monitor. Uh, we have installed a, a continuous air monitor now that, re that actually provides a signal to the central monitoring room that's there 24 hours a day monitoring that uh, item. Now, station A is the previous to the filtration system that we have fixed air samplers there that we sample or take readings on. Now, and, of course, and also what we've done is we've added uh, continuous air monitors in the underground in various areas so that, uh, that f uh, go with the flow of the uh, ventilation system, and we're monitoring those on a continuous basis. Mr. Santos, could I add a thought? Yes, so I you may. agree absolutely with everything Joe said. We uh, remember up until we found the lanyl drum, whether we should have or not, we were more suspicious that there had been a structural failure. So when we found the lanyl drum and were faced with there could be a non-compliant drum, we wrote a potential inadequacy, a, a positive unreviewed safety question determination, and one of the eight ESSs is specific to the issue that there now was at least one and could be many more non-compliant drums. So we followed the process, and one of the eight ESSs uh, speaks to not only the safety um, of off-site individuals and co-located workers, but the facility workers, both above ground and underground. And, uh, and that ESS lays out many controls, particularly continuous air monitors, where they have to be and what their operability has to be and the surveillance of that operability. So one of those eight was in direct reaction to the fact that we now had to assume that there could be other non-compliant drums, and, and that's one of the ADSSs that has the controls both above ground and, and below ground. Okay. So a, a specific question uh, regarding the, the newly installed continuous air monitor underground. Uh, is there a requirement, for example, if, if they were to go out of service to evacuate the underground? I understand the, you're under filtration flow, so you're mitigating releases to the environment. But underground, there might be a, an opportunity where no radiological work is being conducted. You still have workers That's down correct. there. Um, are there requirements that, regarding the uh, in-service condition of the continuous air monitor? Um, yes, there are. And, and uh, I can what will be the actions? Yeah, so we have, a, a, as, as we were talking about the emergency management program, and we revitalized some of the procedures which are the numbers are like 12 ER 4903. That includes all of the continuous air monitors for both. Uh, now it's it going to include both surface and underground, but right now they're separated uh, 4903 and 4904. But they both uh, address the evacuation. If you have for them, for personnel to remove from the area of the where the cam is and take the appropriate actions to move to the egress hoist station and assemble. So there's procedures that we have in place. There's uh, also the, the emergency management program that then exercises those procedure changes to make sure that people understand what the actual um, um, uh, immediate actions are for those uh, items. I, I'll repeat my question. I understand that actions are being described in the event a, a continuous air monitor alarm may, may initiate. My question has to do with if you were to find them out of service, does that trigger some sort of yeah. action? Yes, it does, and we have procedures for that because the radiological control technician who works for Mr. McQuinn here that we oversee, uh, there is procedures involved for them to take uh, actions. If, it's, if, if you have a malfunction, 
are out of service, you know, something that's happening with the cam, any kind of alarm, we have a, a uh, uh, um, appropriate procedure for that. Also, if the radiological control technician gets up there and sees that something is not correct with the with the uh, continuous air monitor, they're supposed to report immediately to the central monitor room and then uh, go through the immediate actions there. So do I need to have the radiological technician available when a malfunction is detected by a worker? No, all workers are trained that if there's an alarm, doesn't matter if it's a malfunction or relation, when they see an alarm from a cam, all workers know what to do with, with that alarm. They have to respond immediately. Am I, I don't know if, if I'm answering that. Uh, so a, a couple of thoughts. So the, the radiological workers are, are trained to respond to the sound of the cam alarm. They do not have to be able to see it. They simply respond to the unique sound of the alarm and they evacuate, okay? So they do not require assistance from the RADCON technician. Then back to uh, the first question to add a little bit. Um, so underground cams must be functional. Now remember, we're in filtration mode. Yes. That first ESS says that I may not leave filtration mode. So the cam's not required to make a decision about filtering or not, but the underground cam must be operational at the beginning of the day in order to go underground. And in addition to that, the ESS requires that both the station A has to be checked, that's before filtration, to prove that there's no activity, and the station B cam has to show that there's no activity. So all those things have to be true before we go underground and clear the underground for work each day. Okay. Okay. Um, one question, Mr. Uh, Blackenhorn. Uh, is my understanding that the filtration, the filtrated ventilation system used to be a standby mode and is now being operated in a continuous mode. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Most of the time, Mr. Santos, the, uh, under normal operations prior to the events, the 700 series fans uh, provided the ventilation for the underground. The 860 series fans, uh, and there's three of each, uh, the 860 series fans were, were specifically for shift to filtration um, and so they, they pull the air through the HEPA systems. Um, the, the systems themselves were designed uh, to run periodically um, as, as 700 series fans were, were either taken out of service or for repair or maintenance. Uh, they were also used to augment the ventilation system that the 700 series fans provided. Um, now, I don't, I don't know that I would go so far as to say they weren't designed to run continuously. But, but clearly prior to the events, it wasn't envisioned that we would operate um, the WIP facility as a contaminated facility and therefore wouldn't have the need uh, to run through the filtered system continuously. Can you describe some of the challenges you've been having with this new mode of operation? Uh, in terms of the fans themselves, Mr. Santa, yes. On the system, yeah. So um, I, think, I think the most um, important challenge or the most significant challenge that we've been having uh, with with these fans is is just the reliability um, there are three we need one of them to operate and we need a second one to be as a standby um, ideally we'd have all three of them fully functional uh, but but in order to uh, run these systems and do the preventive maintenance checks and services on them uh, in some cases, they have to be operational. In some, some cases, they have to be uh, turned off. And so we do have to cycle the fans to be able to perform the quarterly and annual preventive maintenance checks on them. But, but more importantly, I think the reliability of the systems is, is an ongoing challenge that we're spending a, a great deal of effort and putting a great deal of attention on. Um, obviously, the, again, with the thought that these fans were wouldn't necessarily be needed uh, to run in filtration mode for long periods of time. Uh, we're, we're going through now and looking at, at how these fans operate, whether they're the damper systems are manual or automatic, um, the electrical systems that feed them. Uh, we're looking at all of these things and looking at it from the perspective of now that we've, we look at them as important to safety, and that's post-events. Uh, we're looking at all the things we need to do to increase the reliability of these systems going forward uh, and thinking that we're going to have to operate them for a period of years. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Uh, just a couple of brief questions. Uh, first for you, Mr. Hudden. Uh, soon after the events, the board communicated to the department its concern about ensuring the, the viability of the confinement ventilation system. And uh, the board advised the department to evaluate the safety controls and contingency plans necessary to maintain functionality of the confinement system. And DOE responded in April of 2014. Since that time, you know, things have progressed. More activities have come online. What process is DOE using to ensure that the integrity of the confinement system is maintained? I'm sorry, could you repeat? I didn't quite understand all those things. What review process is DOE using to ensure maintenance of the integrity of the confinement ventilation system and protecting the public? In I see. Uh, that's been, uh, you know, the subject of of these temporary safety basis documents that, that we've put in place. Uh, you know, shortly after the event, we st started to, you know, we recognized the significance of, of the uh, ventilation system, and so we recognized the need to put in place controls that would maintain it functioning properly for confinement purposes and so on. And, uh, and so we did that through, principally through the ESS process, mm -hmm. through the, uh, the temporary safety basis documents that the contractor prepared and that, and that DOE uh, reviewed and approved. And so those in, uh, put in place controls to preserve the operability and the integrity and uh, functionality of, the, of that system to perform its confinement function. And then, of course, you know, we perform oversight of that, as Bob described, uh, or, or Jim. Uh, they do an independent verification of the implementation of those controls. Do we provide an oversight of that uh, to satisfy ourselves that that was adequately put in place, uh, things that would protect the integrity of those fans, combustible material controls, vehicle barrier controls, uh, as well as routine monitoring of the filters and the fans and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so you know, that's fundamentally the process we've used to make sure that those systems remain operable. Okay. So, um, Mr. McQuinn, we, we talked about, you know, key control when it comes to radiological events. What are the fire protection controls in place that are essential to ensure uh, the integrity of the confinement ventilation system. What are some of the key fire protection controls? Fire protection related mm -hmm. to the, the uh, ventilation that, that system. That are important to ensuring the functionality of the confinement ventilation system. Okay. Um, you know, there's a whole suite of fire protection controls around uh, life safety, but mm -hmm. um, sort of unique to the ventilation system, um, the primary temporary controls because there weren't any that were defined in the existing uh, revision for the DSA are around combustible loading uh, to make sure that uh, both inside the filter building, the exhaust filter building, and in the area that could affect uh, outside the building, one of the, the very first ESS implemented uh, uh, transient combustible controls. and. Um, that is the, the primary way that there might be a scenario where fire would, would affect the reliability of confinement ventilation. Now, as, as we write revision five, obviously we're taking a complete new look from a hazard analysis standpoint. Ultimately, we, we could end up changing the functional classification of the existing system. Um, but, but right now, through the ESSs, it's mostly transient combustibles. Yeah. If, I could, if, I could, if I could add one thing to that, you know, yes, uh, and, and Bob knows this, but the uh, obviously the filter system itself can be affected by, uh, you know, a fire in the underground, uh, and so controls on on cleanliness of uh, diesel-driven equipment, hydraulic systems, so that they are not likely to uh, create a fire. Uh, limitations on diesel exhaust. Uh, ensuring we have the proper airflow in the right places, both to protect the people in the area, but also to ensure that the that the filter system remains in service and performing its confinement function, as well as you know the monitoring of the filter system and uh, various differential pressures in the underground, so on. You know, all all controlled through um, the ESS controls that were put in place. Yeah, in fact, Jim triggers another thought: um, soot loading from a fire that would make its way to the filters and blind the roughing filters and and, and they in turn fail and, and potentially damage the HEPA filters. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't adequately addressed in the, um, in the current DSA. And so that first 
ESS also addressed what, what happens if there was a fire and significant soot loading. And so there's delta pressure controls that are embedded in that ESS that, uh, that make sure that we, that we replace filters so that if, if we had another event, uh, we wouldn't have a pressure drop, drop problem that, that would affect the, the HEPA filters. Okay. So uh, I guess, Mr. Franco, my last question on this topic is, uh, and I recognize as Mr. Woodney cited, you guys are moving expeditiously to close uh, panel six and to close the subject room in panel seven. Um, is, uh, what gives D DOE confidence that the contractor has the right contingency plans in place in, in just in the event that you did have another drone event? Mm -hmm. um, what gives us the confidence is that we have seen, um, you know, drills and exercises as we continue to move forward with this process. Also, we have uh, been providing uh, a large amount of oversight on as these things are being developed, both uh, all the way from their engineering to implementation and the operation side. And the other thing that I think for me that makes me feel really confident is that we, we have also reached out to the department and have received uh, technical experts to come in that have not been normally engaged so that they're coming in with fresh eyes and are looking and, and they're coming back and saying okay this one uh, fits and it, it looks good and we're going forward in this process so it's been a very uh, uh, for me it's uh, it's a continuous effort where we continue to monitor continue to oversee um, we have the expertise now you know we we have a new uh, employees and that with MSHA experience our team has a lot of mining experience uh, now with the segregation again as we talked about for the organization uh, that you're starting to see the fruits of that uh, our team is actually engaged in a lot of the detail uh, of the oversight piece of it uh, and so I'm uh, you know good to start seeing the progress as we're moving forward now, still having the mentoring process ongoing we, we will not stop that uh, where we're having the expertise also come and support our field activities and making sure that we're uh, applying the, the rigor that needs to for each of these items. So, so far, the, the, uh, as we're moving forward, the planning and approach that we've taken, especially like these panels, uh, panel seven, room seven, and getting that closed is a key component for us. And then also the decontamination that's going on now, that's critical as we move forward in the operation, and that's going very well as we, uh, as we move forward. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunnigan, you mentioned uh, earlier the challenges uh, associated with bringing uh, more ventilation online. You mentioned an interim ventilation system, a supplemental ventilation system. I understand we need more ventilation in order to run more machines underground. Uh, will there be any nuclear safety functions performed by these additional ventilation systems? Um, the, the interim ventilation system is classified as important to safety. Um, through the DSA process in Revision 5, it will be determined if it is required to be identified as safety significant. I believe that's the source of your question um, through this time. But it is being um, constructed with quality requirements that will allow it to be support commercial grade dedication to safety significant over time. But initially, it's identified as important to safety. Okay. So uh, this, these systems will be uh, in the documented safety analysis as that document will be revised later? Oh, yes, Mr. McQuinn, is that correct? Yes, if I could add, so uh, for both the interim and the supplemental ventilation systems, there, there are very likely to be uh, ESS level controls for each of those, okay? And so right now we're, uh, we're using a temporary safety basis with respect to the construction of the systems, and then there will be a revision to that uh, to uh, authorize its startup. And so uh, we, Sean is right, we have uh, functionally classified the systems as important to safety, but I'm certain that there will be ESS level, TSR level controls uh, related to both. And, uh, and right now we're writing the, the new revision to the DSA and we're working our way through what is the correct functional classification for the existing system. And we're anticipating that that functional classification uh, could increase and so we're doing NQA one quality construction of the interim ventilation system so that we can do commercial grade dedication to it and backfit it to a safety significant uh, functional classification if, if it turns out that the revision five uh, 
concludes that that's what it needs to be. Uh, how about uh, NQA quality requirements in the procurement, in the, in the pieces and parts? Are we going to have confidence that they are going to be made to uh, nuclear standards for a safety significant system? Okay. Jim, you want to help me with that? Yes, uh, Mr. Sullivan, the, uh, the contractors and the procurement process that we used um, verified that that the vendors being used were all NQA1 qualified, uh, and that they also, uh, and you'd recognize the names, but uh, they also provide products to the nuclear industry, so they're very familiar with, with the nuclear standards. Uh, and so in this particular, in the IVS case and in the, in the supplemental ventilation system, uh, both those systems, uh, the equipment is being procured to the NQA1 standards not just the, the final product, but all of the manufacturing um, and, and their procurement processes for materials and equipment. That's all being uh, following, following the process, and we've got inspectors that are, that are there routinely watching, watching the fabrication and manufacturing. The, the permanent ventilation system, um, obviously that'll go through a, a different process in terms of uh, it, it's going through the 413 uh, process and so it'll it'll have its own PDSA, which will define its uh, functional requirements. Uh, so it will not be in the DSA Rev 5. The IVS and SVS will, uh, but but its procurement strategy will then follow whatever the PDSA functional requirements uh, require. Okay, uh, Mr. Franco, my last question. Uh, is there anything about this interim ventilation system that really makes it interim? Um, it's going to be like the first P in WIP, where 15 years later it's it's still a pilot plant. Um, well, where, you know, 15 years from now, is this interim ventilation system going to still be operating? That's a very good question because from the very beginning, when uh, this uh, approach was uh, discussed and then uh, as we started to implement. Uh, the permanent ventilation system is the key for us to to be able to switch from this interim ventilation mode. And depending on the outcome of that, it's going to be critical for us to make sure that that stays on target so that this does and stays as a temporary uh, fix. Uh, it's critical for the ventilation system for the, and the habitability of the underground that um, we move forward with the permanent ventilation system. Uh, to, again, not have these temporaries become permanent. Okay, well, my experience with Washington, D.C., is that if you, if you actually do it right, you'll get penalized because then it'll work fine and somebody in the future will say, well, I'm going to save money. I'm just going to stick with this thing. Um, but in any event, you know, just more commentary. Uh, obviously, needs to be done right. Um, so I, I look forward to see how the whole system comes together with the right... Uh, requirements so that it can operate as a safety significant system and again for me it's you know the the whip project is a critical asset for the whole nation our uh, where we are today uh, has shown that we are vital for the nuclear operation in this nation and so for us to leave temporary systems in place and not go to a permanent ventilation system uh, does not make sense to me and so that's, uh, understand the uh, thought there, and I'm, I, I'm pushing hard that that will not happen. Okay. I'd like to ask a follow-up question. It, it is my understanding that some of these interim ventilation systems items are not only being procured, but actually delivered to, to site. Is, is my understanding correct? Yes. So my question to DOE is, uh, have you done right? any ex inspection that confirms that indeed there are like NQA1 uh, type requirements or are we waiting for some sort of gap analysis? I just want to, if I were to look at some of the documents, what would I find today? Yes, uh, our QA department in, the, in my office has been overseeing the, the uh, uh, procurement of this system. And uh, as we have received them, we've been following and doing the oversight with the contractor as they have started their receipt inspection of the equipment. So we, we were involved when they were building it and we're involved now where it's been delivered. And, uh, and as a quick follow-up, um, 
uh, as you know, design takes time and getting the requirements all mature is very important. Um, have any of your preliminary analysis in support of the new revisions to the DSA, you know, hazard analysis preliminary, have shown the need to actually uh, change some other systems, such as like diesels or the electrical distribution? A any comment on that? No, uh, I can tell you that we're going through that process now. Uh, there's still been a lot of discussion and, uh, you know, uh, to get into some very specifics of, you know, every one of those systems is being analyzed right now, uh, looking at the diesel generator backups that, uh, for, mer for emergency power. Uh, that's one of the evaluations. Uh, the other one is, again, the, the ventilation system that we have in place. Uh, but also looking at the rest of it, we have, uh, uh, you know, the contact handle bay and the remote handle bay that are, are part of our safety base and making sure, and then the whole underground, looking at those. So uh, as we move through the process, all of those items are open for review and discussion. So when do you expect that to be completed? Oh, we, we have put a team together, as we talked about that workshop, that uh, safety basis review team uh, has put a strategy and approach together to go through this process. And there's a schedule that shows when each chapter is being done. And uh, we have extended a, 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 an open invitation to one of your colleagues to, to be present with us as we go through these processes. And as each chapter is being developed and, and analyzed, we're going through that. Uh, I don't have the schedule in front of me. I could give you the dates of that if you want at a later time, but uh, right now I don't have those dates. Now I ask a question. As you know, when, when we go to safety, my experience when you go to safety quality, um, the lead times tend to be uh, right. longer and having a good integration from the beginning is, is, is very important, especially as you integrate with your uh, recovery efforts. So I just wanted to get a, an understanding on how all of that was being, you know, properly integrated. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Franco, if you would, if you could provide additional information to answer that for the record, that would be great. We'd appreciate okay. that. Okay. Um, the, the February 2014 events revealed a number of issues, and this is to Mr. Blankenhorn, uh, with WIPS emergency preparedness program. Uh, for example, emergency response procedures were not followed, expert-based decision-making uh, created more hazardous evacuation conditions. Uh, critical communications were not heard throughout the underground and workers had difficulty donning self-rescue devices. What compensatory uh, measures have been implemented to address these deficiencies and ensure that the workers in the underground as a part of recovery can adequately evacuate if necessary or protected during the recovery work? Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chairman. Uh, I'm actually going to describe for you a, a phased approach to compensatory measures. Uh, immediately following the events, uh, we, we did a very in-depth, comprehensive, deliberate review of our safety management programs, uh, including emergency management. And uh, as a result of that, we identified a number of deficiencies, and the Accident Investigation Board Fire and AIB Phase 1 also identified a number of programmatic deficiencies related to uh, emergency management and emergency response. We put in place at that point in time uh, several uh, compensatory measures that included, uh, as Bob mentioned, we went out uh, right after the events and obtained uh, senior management experts from around the complex and we brought those individuals in. Uh, to provide mentoring and coaching and oversight of our facility operations. We, we added conduct of ops mentors and coaches to our shift crews. We put uh, senior mentors in the control room uh, to provide uh, assistance and guidance on, on classification and categorization. Uh, and then we added a, a, um, a requirement that, that our management team um, conduct and start implementing field management observations and assessments on a routine basis. So we put those steps in place almost immediately. Um, and then we, we went and we developed a uh, dual path. Uh, we recognized that the emergency management program as a result of these assessments was not compliant. Uh, it had not kept up with the NIMS uh, requirements, the national framework. Uh, it didn't have incident scene command structure built into it. 
And so while we were implementing the compensatory measures, we then have started down, and we're probably 60% complete now, with a complete overhaul and revitalization of the emergency management program. We, we've hired additional staff. Um, we've hired um, a new emergency management manager who came in with a great deal of experience. We've restructured the organization. We've, re we've created new positions compliant with, with the uh, current standards and requirements in the DOE orders. We've revised procedures and programs. We've trained and qualified these people to their new positions. Uh, we've run a number of drills and exercises. We run two or three drills a week. Sorry. No, I was going to ask, give, ask you for an estimate of how many drills you think you've uh, we, run we since run, the last year. We run two to three drills a week. These are tabletops. Is no, that no. what we're talking about? Uh, Madam Vice President, these are actual drills. We started early on with... with Not Vice President. Yeah, I'm sorry, Vice President. I'm going to But thank you. Yeah, there you go. You got my vote. Uh, we, we started early on with tabletops, and we focused on the shift managers who were making the decisions, and we focused on the radiological controls organization and the emergency management organization. Uh, but we quickly moved to full-scale full, uh, full -scale drills um, that, w that we run in the facilities. We had a, um, uh, a process check. I I'd call it a process check. In May, we ran a full exercise. It was the first opportunity, uh, and this was in December, to look at, at how far our program had progressed. Um, and, and it had progressed quite a bit, but it also identified still a number of things that we needed to, to do to, to continue to improve on. Uh, but it was the first test of our new structure and our new organization and our new processes and procedures. Going forward, we've got, uh, uh, we're going to build a new emergency operations center. Uh, we're going to continue to evolve the organization to a fully compliant program. And so uh, th that brings me to the second phase of compensatory measures. Uh, we put in place uh, in the underground, uh, we wrote a document um, entitled Emergency Management and Fire Protection Compensatory Measures, and that was uh, routed and approved by CBFO. Uh, and that included in it a number of things that we're doing in the underground uh, as compensatory measures while we're building this program. And that included things like uh, accountability programs that we had needed to implement. It included uh, communications systems that we needed to have in place to allow people in the underground. It restricted the number of people that we had in the underground at any given time. Uh, it required uh, detailed pre-job briefings to anybody going in the underground. It required uh, fire watch, fire monitoring programs. It required each individual to go through and demonstrate as part of their training and qualifications that they could uh, physically don the self-rescuers. Uh, it included drills mm -hmm. and exercises in the underground where we, we exercise that and we, we select a, a few people uh, during a drill or an exercise to, to come out of their RADCON uh, PPE, including a PAPR, don their self-rescuer and demonstrate that they can do that in a timely manner and in a safe manner compliantly. Uh, so, so those types of things are continuing to run. Uh, we've also uh, implemented a number of, of other uh, programs in the underground uh, that, uh, that include new equipment for both fire protection and emergency management um, and, and we are uh, continuing to use the senior mentors that I referred to earlier as part of our overall compensatory measures. So, so a number of compensatory measures but, but it's running in parallel with a, with a revitalization and an overhaul of a, of a whole new program that's, that's coming along nicely. What uh, in the in this the the major drill the big exercise you did? Uh, what surprised you? What didn't go the way you thought it would go? Um, I think I think I was a little surprised actually at how well it went. Uh, I actually expected okay, it to I'm be worse. Okay, then I'm asking my question right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but the things that uh, that that we noted uh, during during the exercise were, uh, were the incident scene command. It, it mm -hmm. still had not matured to a point yet where it was effective. And so we've spent an awful, awful lot of effort and time since then working on the incident scene command programs, procedures, training qualifications. And then, and then the, while the construct of the exercise, I think,
think was a positive. On the back end of that, the, the whole hot wash AAR process, how do we learn, how do we collect uh, things to improve upon, that, that part of our drill program was, I believe, was deficient. So, so I think, you know, clearly that's an area that we need to continue to improve on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franco, the Accident Investigation Board identified concerns with the failure to categorize the fire and radiological events as operational emergencies. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So what actions have been taken to ensure uh, that proper categorization and notification of events like this uh, occur as intended in the future? What actions have been taken? Uh, what um, has been changed, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, is um, we have actually uh, uh, had a procedure change and process and program change, and it's back tied to the emergency management program, as we've been discussing. Uh, within that program, the categorization side of the procedure has become uh, more extensive but easier to follow uh, per uh, you know, we're really looking at, as, as they mentioned, they're talking to facility shift managers. They're the first line of uh, personnel that get to make that first determination mm -hmm. so that the uh, notifications go out appropriately and, and uh, expedited. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I have been, our staff have been overseeing has been the actual implementation of that procedure and uh, making the categorizations. And for the uh, watching the training with the facility shift managers and providing them uh, uh, watching the, the, the training organization providing the shift managers a comfortable pathway, including from coming from Mr. McQuinn, that it's okay to be conservative in your initial response and so, watching that. So, so let me just ask, it's not, I mean, we always turn to procedures and we need more specificity. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to be clear, because it's my understanding as well, too, is we need to work on the comfort in making calls that's, like that. That's when they correct. Need to to make a conservative call if that's what needs to be called. Okay. That's correct. And um, I can relate to that because I was a facility shift manager here at the WIP facility before. And uh, as we have discussed and have, uh, I have seen the oversight. And when I go out at the facility, again, I have a, 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 an office out there and I work with them. They feel real comfortable coming and telling me what's working and what's not. And this has been one of the items that they have uh, expressed that uh, they were feeling more comfortable with this. Uh, the other one, uh, as they move through the whole program, uh, you know, from the emergency management side, that they can now make these calls without any kind of uh, questioning. Okay, why well, do you why? think they were uncomfortable? Could I um, add a thought, Joe, to that? Sure. Um, and, and Joe knows my workforce extremely well. Um, but let, let me relate this to safety culture. So let me connect this back to one of the one of the real root causes um, that we're working on. In my first week, um, I was very concerned about why would my shift managers and my shift engineers and my crisis managers be reluctant to, to categorize and classify and declare an operational emergency. So by the end of the first week, I had met with every qualified shift manager, shift engineer, and um, crisis manager in, in private meetings, group meetings, face-to-face. -face. And, um, and they convinced me that they felt criticized at times in the past for declaring uh, when it wasn't necessary. And, um, and that, I think, is a commentary on uh, part of the safety culture issue. And so, you know, with Joe's support, but it's really my job to get this right, uh, my emphasis has been completely on recognizing people that have the courage to make a conservative decision and stop work. Now, there is accountability for not getting things right. But the emphasis, uh, certainly up until now, has been all around recognizing people who stop, even if they didn't need to. And so, uh, so the safety culture piece is hugely important. I think we're making great progress, but, but we have to protect that all the time. Thank okay. you. Mr. Santos had a follow-up? Yeah, quick follow-up. Uh, I agree with the vice chairman. I, I think specifics are, are important. So this question is for Mr. Franco, but others can, can feel free as like, so let's go to specifics. I understand you're developing procedures, training, a whole set of improvement initiatives, and, and I think that's good. What, what, what will happen today? Let's say right now we can postulate an, an event. What, what is the expectations today, even as you leadership sits, even in this room? 
what what will happen if you can explain the process in specific the, so the public can understand? You know, we let's take a scenario where we have an underground event. Uh, immediate notification to the central monitoring room uh, happens. Central monitoring room sets off the alarm, makes the notification. The facility shift manager goes up to the central monitoring room supporting the notification and starts making the notification to all senior staff, uh, e activation of EOC, all of those activities. Uh, the activation process then gets initiated, which uh, has been an, uh, one of the programs that has been enhanced. Uh, we now get pager and, and cell phone uh, tests uh, more than twice a week. Uh, and as we get those, you know, how far, fast can you respond? And so all of that gets initiated right away. Uh, that, that, that part of it has been tested in the drills, and, and we actually perform those functions. Uh, so that's, that's not uh, something that's simulated. It's actually conducted uh, during these events. Um, so a if an event was to happen today, as we're sitting right here, we would get the notification. We would have to re tell you that we got to leave, and we would leave. Uh, we could, you know, for me, we would tell you later what, what was going on as, as we would go back to our offices there. Uh, the Joint Information Center is stationed here at our office. We would activate there. Now, what's coming in the future is our um, uh, EOC is going to be actually in place here at this facility uh, here in town. Uh, as, as you know, in most uh, DOE facilities, uh, their emergency operations center is not located inside that facility itself. Uh, WIP, we did that from the beginning as a pilot, and uh, we part of the lessons learned here is that we need to have the segregation. So uh, that would happen immediately from the events. Uh, so, it, it, so that's immediate actions that are taken. We would get notified immediately uh, again. So, and a follow up to that: When will this, is for Mr. Houghton, where DOE headquarters will come in in this scenario, and when will other like federal and local partners will be integrated? And then finally, when will the public mm -hmm. be notified? If you can extend. Sure, I can extend it. There. So the immediate more. action is, is as soon as the, uh, the facility shift manager makes a notification, the ELC is activated. Once the ELC is activated and the people are in the emergency operations center, the notification to DOE goes off that, at that moment. There's a, a, a DOE representative that has a responsibility to make that call to the to headquarters then I have a responsibility also to uh, notify um, my management chain. And Mr. Hutton has provided guidance for us from the, like the, from the FAC reps for them to provide immediate notification. So there's three tiers of notification now that go back to the headquarters, uh, I let them know where we are with the activity. And then from the EOC, all of it's governed from the EOC on what needs are required and needed. So if I need some support from outside agencies, uh, everything's coordinated from the Emergency Operations Center following the NIMS process. Could, um, Could I have a thought, Mr. and then Jim probably has a thought. Um, so right now we track scheduled drills in our plan of the day meeting. Okay, We track every one, and it takes Jim or my approval to postpone a drill. That's how serious we take it. We run many unannounced drills, and we run them when there are people in peppers in the radiological area where there's real risk of running the drill with people um, down in panel six or panel seven, but we do it anyway because it's important. Uh, so the unannounced drills, it takes Jim or me to approve those. Nobody else knows it's gonna happen and we run those. And then finally, in terms of me becoming a little more comfortable that the shift managers will make a conservative call about a month ago we had an off-site oil release, but it was on the property. And, um, and it turns out, and we ran that, and we, ac we activated the EOC, and we ran the EOC for several hours, and then later we concluded that we, we probably didn't need to do that. But we still thanked the shift manager and the emerge crisis manager for making a conservative call. Now, we learned a lesson in terms of when do you need to and when do you not need to, but in that case, there was no reluctance to, uh, to actually run the EOC for several hours before we, we were comfortable that we didn't need to be activated. Um, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to become complacent, but I'm becoming more comfortable that conservative decision making is understood as an expectation. And I would just add, Mr. Santos, so uh, as Joe did. <laughs> sure. Is that better? 
Okay. I'll sink down a little bit. Scooch down. Okay. So a couple of things I'd just like to add to what, what Joe described. Uh, so Joe described uh, when the CMR gets the notification, they start to take actions. And, and the, the first thing they do, because they've been trained and qualified, is, is they take immediate actions. But, but someone in the control room is opening up the procedures and following step by step the requirements for immediate action. The organization itself, though, so, so all the workers are taking immediate action in response to the event, whether that's evacuation or shelter in place. And then, uh, as Joe mentioned, as we follow through on your question about the notifications, there are specified requirements for how long we have to notify DOE. And I, and I believe, Joe, it's 15 minutes, isn't it, that we have to get something up to DOE? But that's that's spelled out, and and it's you know it's one of the action steps in our in our response procedures. There's also then requirements, uh, with, I think within 30 minutes, for us to make notifications by phone and by fax to local uh, enforcement, to local emergency management centers, yeah. to the state emergency management. So we call all of the action officers, the on-call action officers, who then are responsible for making the notifications to the actual staffs of the of the emergency management systems. I, I think we're going to scrub yeah. this some more in the evening yeah. session. I mean, okay. because yeah. these were in place before. I mean, yes, they're they not were. new. And so right. I think what we're going to want to do later is dive into what's different. So uh, right. Mr. Sullivan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So Mr. Hutton, uh, We've heard about some changes within uh, CBFO to improve their performance. Uh, so my question to you now is, uh, is, is EM satisfied with the structure uh, of the uh, field offices that exist now? Uh, do we have the right division of responsibilities within the office? Do we have the right number of people? Do those people have the right skills, training, experience, et cetera? I think we're we're quite happy with the change in the organization that has been described. You know, separating the the oversight function from the uh, from the production. I, I think that was essential. I think it was a good change. Uh, I think that's I think that's beginning to work well. Um, uh, I'm quite pleased with some of the folks that have been brought on board. We've participated in the hiring uh, process, interviews, and so on for the for the folks that have been recruited and brought into. Uh, CBFO. Uh, some of them are quite strong, uh, have a lot of experience at other facilities uh, in the complex, and, and they bring that to bear in, in this at CBFO. So I think that's, I think that's very positive. Um, I've not been happy that we've been able to hire people quickly enough. It's been difficult to bring, uh, to attract people to be, you know, willing to come to this area. That's, that's frankly been a bit of a problem uh, I and I would uh, like to see more of those folks in place but I'm quite encouraged with the number of the people that have been brought in and their skills and abilities I think they're I think they're strong so uh, well, was I'll there something some, else uh, no I'll ask some follow-up questions uh, taking those things one at a time um, so with respect to dividing the responsibilities between programmatic responsibilities and uh, oversight responsibilities uh, is this something that's been instituted uh, throughout the DOE complex? Uh, most all, there is no specific requirement about that that I'm aware of. However, um, most all sites have that kind of separation. Most all sites that I'm aware of have that kind of structure. Okay. M my experience is it's, it doesn't magically fix things. Uh, Sometimes, yeah. In some cases, you just end up with a little bit of headbutting between, well, there, between yeah, the two groups. And perhaps there should be a little bit of a healthy tension there. I think that would be appropriate. Uh, but, uh, but I do think it's important that, just, uh, that, that folks understand their clear role and responsibility. And sometimes, you know, you have to, they have to take off one hat and put on another. You do it too many times, pretty soon they forget which hat they're wearing. So uh, I, think, I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to have that structure. All right. Uh, so, with respect to uh, some of the hiring issues, Mr. Franco, can you can you comment? Uh, are there things that you'd like to see Mr. Hutton do back in Washington to fix some issues here? We have actually uh, 
been working that issue from the start with and have had uh, great support from Mr. Hutton as our driver in D.C., so that's been a positive. I can tell you that it hasn't been uh, without effort there. We, the amount of, uh, of offers that have been made and, and the incentives that I have been uh, provided to be able to provide, uh, I, I have the highest incentive uh, uh, authority right now uh, for the workforce as a hiring. And uh, we are maxing them out, and they still are coming back and saying no. Uh, you know, my, and I'm getting various things from you know. Uh, it includes just the uh, what, what's what's within this region. Um, there's been for medical reasons, and there's also been uh, because of the um, economy here. The um, the housing market is a lot higher than where most people are wanting to come from. Uh, so that becomes a challenge for them to be able to accept that uh, with a boom in the oil, even even bringing them in and they're seeing the, the hotel prices, uh, which have started to come down some. But uh, those have been some challenges that we have. And we track this and we, we report it to headquarters on a weekly basis. I know that um, my management team, Mark Whitney and company, have monitored this. They, they're trying to help us as much as they can. Uh, the postings are going out as fast as they can. And then, uh, you know, when you have four... Uh, turndowns on uh, on a specific, um, even at a grade 14 level, uh, that that's huge. And so it's just those kinds of things. Now, what we have been uh, really uh, fortunate with is that we have brought in a lot of good people for the nuclear safety side of the house and the uh, oversight piece. And so, um, with uh, you know, I have a senior uh, nuclear safety technical advisor now. Uh, and he has definitely, he's leading the, SB, uh, the, the, the safety basis review team. And uh, if you get the chance to talk to your staff, he has, he has really taken control of this and has been a great leader in that uh, side. Um, and then, again, the, the efforts that we're doing to try to get the employment levels up, uh, we're still about, uh, you know, the organization's going to change over 50%. So it's a totally, it'll be a totally new organization when we're done. We're going from about 50 to all the way to 77 type uh, uh, amount. And then I'm having attrition also as that happens. So the, the huge turnover uh, uh, from the concept of new folks coming in. And most of them, or all of them, have, uh, are not born and raised in Carlsbad like we have currently uh, a pretty good set of. Um, so that hiring process is still a challenge for us, and uh, we have advocates up in headquarters, including Mr. Hutton, that really drive and help us through those process wherever we get a hang up on anything that drive that through, whether it's human capital or any of those. And uh, we've been um, just moving through this process and making sure that we stay within the requirements of the hiring process, but uh, it's been a challenge. Okay, well, um, short of trying to destroy the local economy, to help yourself. Uh, are there other things that you can do? Uh, for example, are some of these programmatic functions, can somebody back in Washington do some of these things? Yeah, and, and that's exactly what we've been doing is supplementing CBFO's staff with, with, uh, with our staff, yep. with staff from other sites, uh, and with, uh, with some contractor support as well. You know, very strong people, frankly, that have been spending a great deal of time uh, doing nothing but worrying about WIP and helping out perform some of these functions. But that's not a good long-term solution, you know, but, it, but it's certainly necessary right now. And so that's what we've been doing. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't have any additional questions. Mr. Sullivan, any more questions from you? Are we, uh, are we done? I'm done. For um, this, at this point, do you want to go back to... Uh, well, yes. Let me, okay. let me go ahead and can go I, back then and... Can I... Can I'll go ahead. Can I interrupt and a follow-up question to your last question? Certainly. It's just for the record. I would like to get on the record. What 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 is your current shortage from a staffing standpoint? Uh, right now, we to to meet the you know where we were headed with our current organizations, 18. 18. Yeah. So Thank we've had uh, you know uh, hired up. We initially we had 22. We've hired nine new personnel, but I had five at trip. Okay. And then. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Okay, Mr. McQueen, um, we mentioned earlier some pre uh, preventive maintenance issues that were brought, up, brought out in, uh, specifically in the fire accident investigation uh, report. Um, 
so uh, as I recall from that report there was like a whole page of things that were being done on for example the salt truck that had the fire uh, there was a whole page of things that were being done uh, here at the site by the maintenance uh, organization that were different than what the manufacturer had recommended uh, so different periodicity where they were using different equipment or instead of washing down the truck with water they were they were uh, using compressed air uh, can you talk about how it got to be that way and what's been done to change that the overall preventive maintenance or, or that specific yeah the overall preventive maintenance okay. program right. um, so I think there, there is no doubt that um, we weren't putting the priority both financially and organizationally and day-to-day -day execution on preventive maintenance uh, particularly safety related preventive maintenance and um, so one of the one of the new managers new experience managers that I brought in was to take over the the uh, maintenance organization and this is an individual who has particularly high experience base from Pantex with respect to both deferred maintenance and replacement uh, of critical equipment so uh, so we have a new leader uh, to make sure that uh, that we execute the preventive maintenance uh, properly okay of course we will talk a lot more about work planning and control and, and that plays a part in, in making sure that we're ready to do preventive maintenance when it's uh, when it's needed so a new manager a lot of emphasis on um, on the execution of the work but I think part of the root cause was um, as um, as my organization made hard priority decisions um, there wasn't enough priority on preventive maintenance okay one of the, uh, the one of the tools that I'm going to use is a it's a brand new standard uh, that AECOM has produced based on all the best practices from all of the projects and nobody has it exactly right and I'm going to adopt uh, a, a new standard on how to evaluate preventive maintenance and make important important priority decisions and then we've uh, we've launched as part of our baseline a uh, an improved integrated priority list to, to make sure that uh, Jim and I understand what what decisions we have to make with the funding and the resources that we have and then sort of from a process standpoint um, in the last two months I've added one more one last direct report to me and I call the function project integration and so I, um, I'm borrowing a very experienced uh, project integration manager from Savannah River, but I think that function I need to keep us honest as, uh, as we look right now at a very good funding scenario and how to spend that money, not only on recovery, but on infrastructure things that, that are needed. And so I've created a new function with an experienced person so that I think that the decision making around what to put priority, both money and resources, on and then the maintenance manager to execute that well when we give it priority so those are some of the things we've already done and some some things that are yet to come all right so um, some of the examples were for example uh, battery maintenance uh, required at uh, 250 hours and instead it was being done at 500 hours um, if for some reason somebody in the organization today wants to do something like that the manufacturer says this should be the periodicity and they believe they're going to use a different periodicity what's required to get that approval well I think the uh, I think the maintenance process um, is adequate I think the piece that was primarily missing that that most of the mature sites have is uh, where there is a strong cognizant system engineering program and system engineering program um, up in a year ago the system engineer didn't have to be involved in making the decision or agreeing with the decision to defer the maintenance on the battery from 250 to 500 hours now we're we're still early in uh, in getting cognizant system engineers qualified and in place but what we're adding to the process is engineering has got to step up uh, not that the maintenance guys don't have good reasons to consider a change like the one you discussed but I've got to have an honest broker and that's my system engineer involved in assuring that that's defensible particularly for the safety related preventive maintenance okay. and when it comes time to do the maintenance then um, who is responsible other than the worker who gets assigned to do the maintenance to make sure it gets done right is there 
somebody who's going to be watching periodically or some sort of random check to make sure that when the maintenance is done, we're using the right equipment, um, we're not taking shortcuts, uh, we are, um, we're doing what's supposed to be done. How, how's that process going to work? Well, let me start, and Jim, you, you helped me remember what, what I'm overlooking. The, uh, the maintenance line organization is, is primarily accountable uh, to me to make sure that they're looking at the quality of, of their work. If it's a safety-related credited system, then there better be some kind of, um, some kind of surveillance related to that maintenance that, that, that uh, proves that the functionality that's required has been achieved. And then ultimately for all of us, uh, including myself, that have to get into the field, um, right now all of my emphasis as we go into the field is going to be around technical safety requirement uh, compliance. But there will be times when I'll instruct the whole senior team, when you go out this week and you do your field monitored assessment and you report that back to me, take a look at PMs that are going on. And so it starts with the line organization. There is an engineering oversight part when it's safety related and, and then it's all of us that do uh, field observations yeah I think I think the only thing that I would add is the is the work packages themselves um, depending on the on the piece of equipment and the maintenance required will spell out exactly what Bob just described which is you know, th there may be independent verification steps QA hold points peer verification um, uh, supervisor requirements and so um, th those are those are being documented and will be captured in the in the actual work control documents um, to m ensure that the work is being done in accordance with the requirements thank you you had a follow-up yeah well, a quick follow-up and I would like to direct a similar line of questioning to the OI, Mr. Donagan you can probably pick up on this one what 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 is the oversight role of DOE when it comes to this example that Mr. Sullivan highlighted regarding some of identified gaps between actual practice and manufacturing and, and, and maintenance. Are you, are you solely relying on the contract assurance system or are you actually going to be performing independent oversight uh, gap analysis? Can you elaborate what, what some of your actions are regarding yeah. this, this item? Yes, I will. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, DOE is actively involved with the oversight of these activities. We have our fact reps who are on site who are, over, who are involved with all of the oversight as, um, as well as the different members of the operations oversight organization. They are continuously following and monitoring the situations as well as maintenance. Um, whenever vehicles are being maintained, DOE is notified and they are involved and included in the um, they have the opportunity to include in the pre-job or the plan of the day meeting um, so they can be aware of all of the activities that are going on and be able to be involved with them as much as possible as well as um, being involved with uh, oversight of all the documentation that goes along with it. And Joe might have more to add to this. I can add to that that in our organization uh, it's not just the oversight group. I have an independent quality assurance program that uh, is deeply engaged with that. And what we do is we, uh, from the construction of any of the um, uh, uh, you know, purchases that are being done, our quality assurance uh, department is engaged. We send people out in the field uh, wherever the manufacturing is happening and we provide those. Uh, also, we have a planned um, inspection and uh, uh, evaluation program that we perform out at the site uh, including anything from conduct of operations, uh, FSMs, to work packages. So they go out and, and then they also monitor the CAS system for the contractor. Uh, also, what we do is we, as we're moving through the, the uh, year, if, if we see a trend on something, my um, quality assurance director or manager comes in and tells me, hey, we're seeing a trend on this and let's get with the director there and we, let's put some focus on this, on this activity. And uh, that, that's a program that uh, is, is in place today. Thank you. I'm, I'm done with it. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Uh, any additional questions, Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Santos? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Hutton, Mr. Franco, Mr. Donegan, Mr. McQuinn, and Mr. Blankenhorn, thank you uh, for your time and your excuse uh, from the table at this time.
At this time, for the board's practice, as is stated in the Federal Register notice, we will welcome comments from interested members of the public. A list of those speakers who have contacted the board is posted at the entrance to this room. There is also a table at the entrance to the room with a sign-on sheet for members of the public who wish to make a statement but did not have the opportunity to notify us ahead of time. If, to, if you wish to make a statement and have not signed up, you may add your name to the list at this time. So I think I don't see any movers. So uh, we, it appears to me we have the list of the speakers, and we will call them out in the order in which they wish to speak, the, in the order that they signed up. I ask you to, uh, to make sure everyone who has uh, demonstrated a desire to speak, uh, we ask speakers to be brief to allow time for others. The chair may interject if a speaker exceeds five minutes but will then give consideration for additional time should the agenda permit. Statements should be limited to comments, technical information, or data concerning the subject of this public meeting and hearing. The board members may question anyone making a statement to the extent deemed appropriate. As a reminder, anyone, including those observing today's hearing live via video streaming, may submit a written statement to the board to be included in the record which is open until May 25, 2015. Contact information for submitting a statement is available on the board's website. We want to thank all the members of the public who have come here and been a part of these discussions today. Uh, and so the first person on my list is Mr. Don Hancock. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I appreciate very much your being here, as well as the board's work over the last many years around the DOE facilities and sites. And I look forward, hopefully, to uh, continued and further involvement of the board with WIP, which I think is very important. My name is Don Hancock. I'm with Southwest Research and Information Center, a 44-year-old nonprofit organization based in Albuquerque. Uh, among other things, we've been uh, watching WIP for more than four decades. Um, I want to address, given the shortness of time, I want to address a couple of issues related to the recovery plan elements that have been talked about today and then spend briefly some time on what I think is a very fundamental flaw in the entire recovery process and um, to get the safety culture back in place. Um, so regarding safety, on February 15th and 16th, after the radiation release, DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership assured workers and the public that there was no contamination of workers' equipment or facilities on the surface. It wasn't until February 19th when the only independent monitoring at the time, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, released their information from their sampling on the surface that there was contamination released. Um, that shows me a couple of things that I think are important. One, the problems with radiation monitoring and detection of DOE and nuclear waste partnership. It also shows the importance of independent monitoring, which is very important going forward I appreciate what the board is doing today in terms of talking to DOE and the contractors, but that's not sufficient for safety. And I think this incident um, clearly indicated. So among the things that needs to happen going forward that hasn't been mentioned today is the continuing funding for CMERC, as it's called, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, and the New Mexico Environment Department to have independent monitoring actually functioning uh, at the surface in addition to what's required by DOE and the contractor. Um, another thing that resulted in that is workers were told that they weren't contaminated when they were. And in at least one case, it was three months after the event before the worker was notified. So those are very unacceptable practices. 
uh, that have to be not only fixed, but demonstrated that they're fixed, not just you know, on paper, et cetera. So that's very important going forward um, in terms of the, sa the safety questions. Um, in terms of regulatory compliance, which there hasn't been much discussion today, the recovery plan states that by March of 2015, in other words, a month ago, on page 16, the EPA recertification has to have been completed. That not only hasn't happened, there isn't even a complete application to the Environmental Protection Agency for recertification. Um, so one of the important questions in terms of regulatory compliance is what is the role of recertification and EPA approval for any reopening of WIP? Obviously, the other important regulatory body is the New Mexico Environment Department. There are numerous ongoing permit violations of the existing permit. The recovery plan unfortunately presumes that the facility can reopen next year with many violations, health and safety violations of the permit still in place. That's an unacceptable position from a health and safety standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, and from a public confidence standpoint. So one of the things that needs to happen is the recovery plan needs to be changed. DOE headquarters needs to specifically say that those kinds of modifications have to be done and uh, compliance with the permit has to be in place. Important to both of those things that I just mentioned is it is not possible for all of those things to be done with EPA and the Mexico Environment Department in the first quarter of 2016 schedule that's in the recovery plan and you heard referred to again today. On the one hand, we're told over and over we're not schedule driven, but the recovery plan, which is the, the headquarters document is out there, says that that is the schedule. So among the other things that needs to happen is the headquarters needs to agree now and soon that that's not the schedule. Not just say we're not schedule driven, they actually need to physically change the schedule in the recovery plan. Um, I guess the other thing I want to mention in terms of these regulatory processes, these are the processes that the public is engaged in and must be engaged in and will be engaged in, and you can't short circuit the timing and the nature of those processes. Um, let me talk briefly about this fun fundamental flaw that I uh, referred to that hasn't been addressed. A fundamental cause of the declining safety culture and these releases is the fact that the what I call the internal pressure in your federal register notice you talked about external pressures mm -hmm. to for schedule and to not comply with safety requirements there's a, a very essential internal pressure that's going on and has been going on recently that I and other people noticed and knew that the safety culture was declining and that is the Department of Energy and its contractors is very focused on expanding the WIP mission, not complying with the start clean, safe, stay clean safety mission that it's required to do under law and under every other practices. We're 14 months after the February 2014 release and DOE still has five, count them, five formal environmental impact statement process is going on to expand the WIP mission for high level waste tanks, high level waste, uh, waste from high level waste tanks at Hanford, commercial waste from West Valley, New York, greater than class C commercial waste from reactors around the country, uh, the surplus plutonium from the Savannah River site, and a fifth one that isn't even related to nuclear, bringing 10,000 metric tons of mercury to store on the surface at the WIP site. And in addition, they want to do heater tests in the underground at WIP to demonstrate the site for uh, high-level waste. So all of these expansion things take time, effort, money, management intention from both headquarters, DOE, CBFO, and the contractors to do these things, it is no surprise that they can't focus on the safety mission. Unfortunately, none 
of those six things has been formally dropped or rejected, they're still out there. And my strong view is that headquarters has to formally reject all of these expansions, most if not all of which are also illegal under existing laws and permits, before we can talk about reopening the facility. Reopening the facility for what? Not to be a safe facility, Mr. Mr. but Hancock, to be, I understand, up. my time okay. is up. Okay. So this is very important that headquarters needs to make these changes to the recovery plan and to their decision making process and the kinds of things WIP is being designed for. Otherwise, we're not going to focus on the WIP mission. We're going to focus on expanding WIP to do other things. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And if you would like to submit a document for the record, we'd be glad to take that as well. Our next speaker is Kyle Marksteiner. Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Marksteiner, and I'm a contractor to the Mayor's Nuclear Task Force. I actually have a uh, two-page letter from Mr. John Heaton. Um, if it's permissible, he wanted me to read that for the record, if that's okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. Um, slowly. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I talk a little you, fast. You can also s summarize it and submit the actual document. Okay. I'll, 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 I want to leave it in his words, or he'll, he'll be upset with me, but I'll do the best I can. Um, good afternoon, esteemed members of the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board, and thank you very much for holding this hearing in Carlsbad. Vice Chairman Roberson, I'm sorry I have missed seeing you, and thank you for being here. We recognize that the rarity of such a public hearing indicates the significance of both the waste isolation pilot plant itself and the severity of the mistakes that led to last February's fire and radiological incident. I know all of you must feel deeply ashamed that you didn't enforce your fire findings at WIP or that you failed to identify the shortcomings of the waste treatment process or poor AK documentation of that treatment at Los Alamos, as well as the incompetence of the CCP programs there and at CBFO to identify and assure how that treatment was occurring. Certifying waste for disposal at WIP that does not meet the WIP WAC is inexcusable. It shakes the very foundation of trust and moral responsibility to one's fellow man. I apologize for not being there today, but I have a prior commitment I am unable to get out of. I hope this hearing is productive and look forward to watching the archived online broadcast. My message today is to emphasize the absolute need for transparency at the WIP level, in Washington, D.C., for regulators, and yes, for the DNFSB. Transparency is not passive. For many years, the DNFSB indicated concerns about a possible fire at WIP in letters to the Secretary of Energy that were, admittedly, published on the website. However, the back and forth discussions on these concerns and their apparent lack of resolution were not brought to the public's attention and obviously not resolved in spite of co corrective action responses. While I understand that your primary mission is to report to the Secretary, the reality is that we live in an area where the media, the public, and host communities need to be directly brought into the discussion to make sure changes are made. It is true that we could have found your letters on the web page and made a bigger deal of them to local WIP management or our congressional delegation, but we are also very busy people and we feel you are the experts. I hope the DNFSB and all regulators will strive to do a better job of bringing the message directly to the community. The public should be informed immediately and directly after every visit you make to the site in the form of an exit conference when the public, when your findings or judgment of safety breaches against WIP are reported directly. You should then report the response by WIP in the way of corrective actions they intend to implement, getting close, and whether responses are adequate. We should then have a minimum of a monthly report from you to the mayor as to which corrective actions are completed and which are outstanding. Too often we hear about some concern and then never get the follow-up about whether it was addressed or why it was not addressed. Furthermore, this information from your findings should be presented in a way that is understandable to the public, not recorded in a way where even people directly involved have trouble understanding the concern. Many of these concerns tie in with our attempt to develop a community assurance program. Vice Chairman Roberson, I was gratified by our meeting in D.C. several months ago when you agreed that the DNFSB would be pleased to participate in such a program. You pointed out several instances where there may be inconsistencies between regulators, and such a meeting of these regulators would allow those and others to be cleared up, as well as finding gaps in oversight. 
We don't believe introducing a new regulator to WIP is the solution, so much as we think the focus should be to tie in the existing regulators, eliminate the quote-unquote silo effect caused by each group handing its own process and sometimes missing key issues, and finally turning these reports into something that is digestible by the public. We appreciate your willingness to be part of this community assurance program, and we understand its development as part of the state of New Mexico's negotiations with the Department of Energy. As a closing statement, the final goal here is the restoration of the waste isolation pilot plant. The salt beds in that area have and will continue to do their job. This is an exceptional resource for the permanent disposal of transuranic waste. We just need to keep working to eliminate human error. Thank you again for being here today. John Heaton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark Steiner. Our next speaker is Russell Hardy. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Carlsbad and thank you for taking your time. Um, my name is Russell Hardy and I am the director of the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, also known as CMERC for short. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are an entity of New Mexico State University. We're funded by the Department of, Edu of Energy uh, to conduct an independent environmental monitoring program of the WIP site on behalf of the citizens of Carlsbad in Southeast New Mexico. And I want to thank Mr. Hancock for uh, acknowledging CMERC and, uh, and, and uh, advocating for future funding for our cause. Uh, one of our missions is to make all of our information available to the public. And that's very important to us, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, just a little history on CMERC. We began our environmental monitoring activities in 1997, which was about two years before any waste was in place in the underground at WIP. What that did was allowed us a good baseline of about two years to establish normal or, or background radiation activities. From thence, we could compare all post-operational activities too. And for about 15 years, uh, we had to look to the 10th decimal place in order to find any activity. Uh, in fact, for 15 years, we found absolutely zero impact to the environment as a result of the WIP uh, waste emplacement activities. Of course, that perfect track record ended on uh, midnight of February 14, 2014. As Mr. Hancock mentioned, uh, the CMERC was the first entity on uh, February 19th to announce that uh, trace levels of radioactive contamination, primarily americium-241 and plutonium-239-240, had been detected at an ambient monitoring station located approximately a half mile northwest of the facility. Since that time, CMERC has collected more than 1,000 environmental samples uh, consisting of, of WIP exhaust air, both before and after HEPA filtration, uh, ambient air on and around the WIP facility, uh, soil samples collected near the WIP facility, and surface water and sediment samples collected from the three public reservoirs in our area. In addition to our environmental monitoring activities, we have a whole body counter at our facility that we use to uh, count the radiation workers at the WIP site, but that we also open up to the public um, for free uh, whole body counting services. Since the WIP release event, we have counted approximately 185 WIP workers and approximately 70 public citizens, uh, all looking for the presence of WIP-related transuranic isotopes. Based on all of these sampling activities, both the environmental and the, and the uh, WIP workers and the public citizens, I can unequivocally state that the safety-related aspects of the repository worked as designed, maybe not perfectly, but they worked and they mitigated the release to the environment, and that we have found no detrimental impact to the environment or to public health. This is not to say that there were not problems or issues or that the operational and radiological responses to the event worked perfectly. Uh, obviously, as we've heard today, there were many problems. But it is my belief that many of these have been or are being addressed at this time. Uh, from my perspective, from being involved with the activity both before the event as well as uh, being very closely involved after the event, 
I do believe that there, there is considerable progress being made, uh, primarily in the areas of transparency, uh, communication, both with uh, the public stakeholders as well as WIP regulators and with CMERC uh, as a whole. Um, I think that the training for contractors and employees has uh, been strengthened considerably. And I think that the radiological characterization and radiological response is being improved as we speak. Um, like Mr. Sullivan, I did not get a telephone call and alerting me to the fact that there was a, a release at the WIP site. I found out about 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon from a Facebook post. And <laughs> so, uh, but since then, I've been invited to participate on what was at, at one time daily uh, teleconferences with WIP regulators and is now weekly and I get uh, all kinds of email notifications, text messages, personal phone calls, anytime there's going to be some type of an operational change that may really uh, lead to a release at the WIP site. So while I do believe that much remains to be done uh, in order to have the entire complex ready for uh, a resumption of waste and placement activities, I am pleased with the uh, progress that has been made to date, and I am confident that waste and placement activities will resume and will be performed in a safe and efficient manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Scott Kovac. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the board, welcome to New Mexico. My name is Scott Kovac with Nuclear Watch New Mexico. Um, I would just like to say that uh, um, we, we, there was a lot of talk about safety bases today, and it's my understanding the safety bases are due to be updated annually. And the question is, you know, what was the current status of WIPS? Uh, safety basis at the time of the accident. I do know that recent reports for Los Alamos' safety basis show that they're all two or three years out of date. And, and this was a problem in the past, and the board, through their efforts and other people, for a brief time in, in 2012, most of the safety bases were all updated, and, and they seem to be slacking off again. And this is just kind of shows the, uh, you know, the the attention, the constant attention that needs to be paid to these issues. Um, the DNFSB has a long history of questioning corrective action measures with their sites, with the with the DOE sites. Um, the the corrective action plans and measures uh, are all very may be very detailed, but the follow through is historically is what's been lacking. Uh, your, your weekly site rep representative reports from your hardworking site reps are just littered of, you know, corrective actions that were d in place for ever, for many many things. But, you know, they're not so much about you know this one worked or this one was followed through. They're all um, just you know, you know, it just seems like. The, the immediate reaction of a, si of, a, of a site is to say, well, we'll do a corrective action. Uh, corrective action. And, uh, you know, the follow through is just seems to be lacking. So I would, I would request that the, the WIP, you know, not open until all the corrective actions for the WIP site are, are, are implemented. And in, in the AIB, the phase two report, there was 40 judgments of needs. And I can only imagine the corrective actions that those will generate, very many, I, I would think, for, e for each one. And I would request that the, you know, all those be met, too, before WIP reopens. Because if safety is the pr priority, all those judgments of needs need to be need to be addressed and and verifiable and that's why I would ask the board if there's any way possible that you could certify or verify the judgments and needs that the AIB two phase two uh, you know ha came up with that it, you know if you if you guys could certify or verify that that would be most helpful because the public has no way of knowing what happens when the, when those uh, when those uh, corrective actions and plans are implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kovac. 
Are there are there any other speakers, any other uh, members of the audience that would like to speak? Seeing no movement, uh, thank you all for your comments. Uh, and at this time, as noticed in the agenda, we will take a recess. The chair calls a recess of this public hearing. We will reconvene at 5.30 p.m. Thank you.